Hello, welcome to How Many Things with me, Mike, and Tom. That delay gets longer every time. Uh, joining us today <laughs> are Oliver and Leah. Um, if you had to quickly introduce yourselves in whichever order you so please, so that our listener base uh, can get a feel for who you are. After you, Leah. Hi, I'm Leah. I uh, am an early career evolutionary biologist. Um, I study birds and reptiles at the moment, but I have I have some knowledge of uh, genetics, which might come in useful in this kind of discussion. And my name's Ollie. I'm a transhumanist. I'm a researcher for the Ministry of Justice, and I've studied cybernetics in the past. So that's, that's where your first degree was in, wasn't it, Ollie? And it? so you you, yeah. you do have some academic knowledge of the subject rather than simply uh, a, a cultural one. Yes. Yeah. Although it's now a good decade out of uh, old, so. Yeah, and I imagine cybernetics is a uh, topic that moves forward very quickly, actually. Yeah, just as soon as you think you've got it all, it moves on. Today we're going to be discussing transhumanism, which uh, Ollie's uh, briefly mentioned. Um, it's useful to have someone who identifies as a transhumanist on, on here. Really, I suppose the, the starting point, as always, is to define transhumanism. So, uh, Tom, if you want to read the, the description of transhumanism that we have, and then uh, Ollie can sort of tell us what it means to him. So, yeah, uh, so the definition of transhumanism we found is the the intellectual and cultural movement that affirms the possibility and desirability of fundamentally improving the human condition through applied reason, especially by developing and making widely available technologies to eliminate aging, to greatly enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities. Uh, there's also two more parts of the definition, um, which I think are a bit uh, on, like that. I think part one is probably what most people are, are talk, expecting us to talk about here. Um, part two is the study of the ramifications and, and potential dangers of those kind of technologies. And then Part three is kind of like libertarians and Silicon Valley billionaires, which I'm I'm not sure that doesn't sound as to me as that much sounds as a like little tongue in cheek. About. Yeah, who knows? Transhumanist indeed. Maybe we'll have four tongues in our cheeks. <laughs> All of them our own. That's the dream. <laughs> so, Ollie, what what does being a transhumanist mean to you as someone who identifies as one? Because there is a, a general perception that it is linked very much to a desire for immortality. Uh, so for me, it's the optimistic belief that things can be improved from their current situation. Um, I'm not what you would necessarily call a technological transhumanist in that I don't think that all the improvements you can have under transhumanism are purely scientific. Um, I think it can be extrapolated even wider. It's basically a belief in um, the possibility of progress and things being improved. So technologically, medically, sociologically, politically, um, it's really not being content with the status quo as it's presented. And I think a key part of that is going to be an active desire to change it. It's just a proactivity regarding this, not simply waiting for things to get better, is it? Improving humanity. Uh, yes, although obviously the degree varies. So, you know, I don't think everyone has to be a biohacker uh, modifying their own body to be a transhumanist. Um, I, I think the, the, the belief in a, a positive progress has to be there though i think that has to be the, the kind of core trait so would you include under that things like um obviously we've got much better at running over the last century for example and that's been a concerted it's a mixture of uh how people eat it's a mixture of training getting better things like, so if someone was doing that with the, the goal of we're going to get under the four minute mile we're going to get under this etc does that does that fall within your definition there it does but i also would reject um the constraints that we put on that. So the Olympics are actually a really good example. The Olympics are basically trying to get to peak human ability in particular athletic endeavors. So if you look at, say, the 100 meters sprint, you're talking about uh, a normal human or an exceptional human running 100 meters in the shortest possible time. And like you say, we've got better and better at that. So at the moment, you know, you've got Usain Bolt, who who seems to be, you know, the, the perfect sprinter at the moment. Um, if you're talking about athletic endeavors, that's one thing, but to transhumanify that, it would be to reject the artificial constraints, um, such as, uh, you know, why no genetic engineering of runners? Uh, why no um, drug assistance? Um, hmm. So Mike and I were talking about this the other day in regards to... Um, uh, Brock Lesnar! <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that's a, that's a really bad example, actually, but um, when you talk about the human body, it shouldn't... I don't think we should limit ourselves necessarily to just what you can do with the human body you're born with. You know, why not improve that human body? If that's going to be pharmacologically, if it's going to be kind of bionics. You know, they talked about um, Oscar Pistorius before he um, destroyed himself 
um, you know, was it fair for him to run with um, the model of legs that he did? And you think, well, why not? Wouldn't you want to see a, a person do a two minute mile? I'd love to see that. Yeah, the context of that discussion was in regards to martial arts competitions and the fact that in the UFC in particular over the last two to three years, drug testing has got a lot stricter um, and a lot more thorough. Uh, whereas previously they used to allow um, sort of human growth hormone replacement or steroid replacement therapy for people who... Testosterone replacement therapy is what they used to allow for people who had reached a certain age where the body stopped producing as much testosterone. And now they don't allow that, which means you know young people have more of an advantage than people who've reached a certain age and their body stopped producing as much testosterone, um, therefore lowering their strength and aggression. Um, and we were saying, like, Leah, you're a martial artist. Yeah. Like, we... We enjoy, you and I, watching large men, small men, uh, men and women of all sizes beat the shit out of each other in a ring, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> would you also enjoy watching that if these people were, like, on every kind of steroid they could get their hands on? Like, it would be more dangerous, but would it be more entertaining if these people were just superhuman? Yeah. I think there's something interesting about watching people at their natural best though yes Um, and i think that there should be room for both of these tournaments to exist yeah Um, sure you just have to be very careful about the crossover of those those uh competitors but i mean when you look at the brock lesnar alistair overing fight from a few years ago when they were both like having to cut down to make the maximum weight you're allowed to be in heavyweight you know when these people have to cut down to 265 pounds and they're six foot five and they're just enormous um you're not going to see that again because those people are not allowed to take the supplements they were taking when they were that big. Yeah. And is that better or worse? It, maybe it's neither. Maybe it just it's different. Like, how much would we enjoy seeing those fights again or seeing those those competitors or just these competitors that are just better than human? From a purely competitive aspect and entertainment aspect, I think it would be very interesting and I, I would enjoy watching it i'd worry about the health of the competitors both oh in God, the yeah. ring and you know just generally from from taking all the supplements obviously but i think to be honest the mma might actually be a really bad example for this kind of thing because like you say <laughs> that, so dangerous you're only going to be able to do a couple of those fights before some 300 pound roid freak pulls someone's head off well, that's really, <laughs> you really want to see said 300 pound roid freak be able to like arm curl what someone else can squat <laughs> so that when they go in for an arm bar, he just just like uh, bicep curls the guy doing the arm bar and just throws him. It'd be great. I mean, if we extrapolate this to kind of athletics generally, if you look at Formula One, Formula One, you have certain drivers who are, you know, they, they keep on coming at the top of their field. So there's clearly an element in Formula One of the driver's skill. Um, but there's also the other element of the engineering of the of the actual vehicles themselves, the pit crews, that kind of thing. But you can see that there could be a similar thing with athletics. You know, it, it, you might have a thing where it might just be the, the, the training and the capacity of the individual athlete plus the engineering team that's with them. So, you know, we, we do it in Formula One. We do it in all kinds of motor racing. Uh, it could be done in athletics. Um, I don't know how you do it. Um, I don't know whether it would even be a great idea at the end of the day. Um, but the, 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 the cap that we have on people performing in certain athletics based on the the natural limits of the human body i mean it's not going to be terribly long before we have people in the paralympics outperforming people in the olympics i I honestly believe that that will happen at some point particularly in stuff like sprinting we're going to be able to design better legs for amputees um i mean what else have we got as examples i think a lot of people underestimate the fact that we're already there in many ways um there are a number of documentaries coming out at the minute i believe there's one on netflix about how prevalent doping is in professional sport and that Russia, for example, had a state-sponsored doping program designed to get around the doping tests for things like the Olympics. Oh, and this has come out now. Um, and it's almost certain that an, an awful lot of participating countries did. Uh, it's not just going to be Russia. The problem, the, the difference is that Russia's had whistleblowers. Um, well, we've had the issues in cycling. Cycling is one of the biggest. That it's if the general sort of consensus is that every top cyclist is doping especially for the long things like the Tour de France. Um, They say they're not, they hide it, but the majority of them have been, and it's just about different ways of getting around the tests. I think whatever whatever system uh, 
they use for athletics in the future. That's really a separate problem because there you're not talking about the kind of the engineering of it. There you're really talking about people cheating. So yes. if we did move to a system with people, you know, uh, having a greater participation of of drugs or or you know steroids or um, kind of other enhancements, you would still be looking that there would be some kind of of limit to what you could be. I mean, if there was a free for all, the guy who wins the wins the hundred meters and holds the world record is going to be the guy who foolishly straps a rocket onto his back, you know, and and, and does it in a couple of seconds and dies. Um, so there's going to have to be some the guy that we fire out of a railgun. Yeah, it's going to be why like Wiley Coyote will hold the world record. Like, you know, like he's got a pacemaker. It's fine. Stick him in there. <laughs> so there will always be rules, uh, and those examples you mentioned is really just people cheating. Yeah, absolutely. For the, for the um, money of it. I think the point I'm trying to make is that people are unaware to what degree many athletes are already engaging in these activities, whether it is within or against the rules. Oh yeah, yeah. And the people think that a lot of athletes are at the peak human physicality when they're actually pushed past it. So talking about that, that kind of, again, kind of playing with the definitions and stuff, what we have as our next point, kind of post-human versus transhuman versus human in, in quotation marks. Where, where does that lie on this kind of transhumanism uh, s- scale? Like what, 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 what are those different definitions? Like, Leah, if we start with human, like biologically, what, what is the definition of human? Mm. Well, if we define it, as basically homo sapiens, then we can kind of almost include certain aspects of transhumanism maybe within that. Um, And I would say that obviously the basic definition of a species is whether you can mate with another individual and produce fertile offspring. And that's kind of the biological perspective of it. Does it have to be offspring or viable offspring? Yeah, for producing fertile offspring, and that's the important part of the most widely used definition of the species anyway. So from my perspective, that's what a human is, anything that is the same species as the type specimen, which is called Linnaeus. So we would only be considered post-human from a biological perspective if we were so biologically altered that we could no longer breed? Yeah, I would say so. By the most common definition of, of species, yeah. So, for example, if somebody replaced the majority of their anatomy with cyborg parts and could no longer biologically reproduce, they would be post-human because not, they wouldn't. No, not really, because there you might be talking about, um, you know, what if someone has a terrible industrial accident and loses their penis? They can no longer reproduce, but you'd still classify them as human. I think you, what you'd be talking about is... What if they were just like a brain? What if it's like full-on Robocop? Is that a human? Ooh. Well, like, is it human problem. anymore, or did it just used to be? I think this is one of those things where we don't really have an accurate definition once we move beyond human into transhuman and posthuman. We won't we don't know what posthuman is gonna look like. Because no one's seen it yet. And it's possible that there won't be one kind of posthuman. It's either will... gonna be really attractive or really hideous. <laughs> well I yeah. feel like it's gonna be much in between. I mean, I get the feeling that, you know, uh... I, I've I've been on the internet enough times to realise that <laughs> humans will sleep with most things. So, <laughs> rule thirty four. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's the porn one, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it exists, there is porn of it, but that just proves that humans will, you know, find anything sexually attractive. Quantum fetish mechanic. <laughs> so, like, at what point does transhumanism become posthuman? Like, do we or do we just is that not answerable? I don't think it's answerable. I think there's going to be. It's like, you know, at what point did Homo sapiens become Homo sapiens? Leo can answer that. <laughs> Actually, no one can. There's no, way, there's no point that you can, you can say in the kind of the long ancestry of, of uh, Homo sapiens. There's no point where you can say, this one is not Homo sapiens, but their child is. You know, that's, that's not yeah. really how biology works. So yeah, we can absolutely. look back. Yeah, I mean, we can look back at like 100,000 years and at, at a particular specimen and say this is not homo sapiens yeah but i think it would be the same with post-human we won't be able to say this guy's human and this guy is post-human i think there'll just be a gradual realization at some point that we've moved beyond vanilla humanity this is human this is amazy <laughs> or homo sapiens and homo deus which i think is the uh there's a book about that that's Ooh, uh, I like that. the road. yeah which is the idea that we can i mean it is very transhuman i haven't yet read this book i've, I've re- uh, he did a book called sapiens um, I'll put a link in the show notes. It's very interesting about the history of the humanity. And then the next book is Homo Deus, which is like, where do we go from here? And is 
I assume is going to be all about transhumanism, but I haven't read it yet, sadly. I've just heard him talk about it. So, Leah, by, so at what point, can you think of any specific changes that could cause something to be considered um, post-humanism, if it was perhaps a mutation or an en- biological engineering or um, genetic editing? What kind of change might cause this kind of thing? Like, this, this shift in category? Um... So, like, so perhaps if yeah. we can, if we compare Homo sapien to whatever it was that was immediately before Homo sapien, immediate being a very relative term in the grand scheme of evolution, which, as we all know, takes a bit of time. <laughs> but, yeah, from a purely kind of biological, technical perspective, as soon as the species would no longer theoretically be able to produce viable offspring with the type specimen of Homo sapiens, then it would, I guess, no longer be Homo sapiens. Okay, so the DNA would have to be just sufficiently altered, but there's not necessarily anything like a different organ or a different like brain makeup that that could clearly register something like this. It would have to just be. Um, if you if you're using the morpho species concept, then you can talk about things like having extra organs, and because then it would be sort of outside. You have to explain of... what that concept is to me. Sorry. <laughs> so that would mean so basically, if it's outside of the current human diversity. Um, I mean, it's fairly arbitrary as well, but when we're looking at fossil species, for example, we obviously can't tell whether one individual could mate with another and produce fertile offspring. So you you use a morpho species concept, which is basically if they're similar enough morphologically and kind of form a discrete group, and then there are other discrete groups, you would call them separate species from that perspective. Is that like breeds of dog or is that like comparing dogs to wolves? Um, dogs and wolves can breed. <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess it, yeah. If we were if we were looking now at different breeds of dogs, we would probably class them as different morpho species. Yeah, if we weren't aware of whether or not they could breed. I suppose one of the next questions is why do we want to mess with humans this way? Why do we want? Why do we feel the need as a as a species to to tinker, to play, to not leave it to natural progression. Natural progression brought us to the point of Homo sapien. Why do we feel the need to interfere? You mean you don't want robot arms? I don't want robot arms. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> um, I would like my human arms to stop being in crippling pain all the time. Perhaps robot arms are the solution for that, but I would rather there be a biological solution. I think there's a, a kind of misunderstanding of the nature of transhumanism there in that most of the stuff that transhumanists are actually interested in is not about how do we become post-human. It's a belief that we will become post-human at some point, but most of it is kind of incremental improvements. It's if we can have a drug that makes us healthier or smarter, we should use that. You know, if, if we have a different way of doing something that is demonstrably better, we should do that. Um, so it's not really about, you know, why would I want robot arms? It's more if your arms have been lost due to an accident or injury, shouldn't your, ro- shouldn't your robot arms be as good as they possibly can be? That is interesting, because I do know someone who's looking into replacing one of their arms. Hmm. And wouldn't they want an arm as capable or more capable than their human one? Or three of them. Well, yeah, if, if someone said to you, you know, I'm sorry, we're going to have to lose your arm. We have two models of prosthetic you can have. This one is exactly as good as your human arm. And this and one, this one has a built-in dart launcher. Or, you know, this one's more dexterous and, you know, uh, has much greater capacity for, for touch. You'd go for Could the you just set an auto, like, you, you paint in your, your board game miniatures and you just, like, auto-paint. It's like, I'm just going to watch TV and my arm's just going to paint this. I mean, I always use the example of sight, because my eyes were damaged when I was born. So I have bad vision. And one of my eyes I can barely see through. So if the technology was there, I would quite happily replace my bad eye with a, a suitable prosthetic. And if I'm going to replace it with a prosthetic, why would I not choose one that could also let me see further in the um, the electromagnetic spectrum? You know, let me see infrared and ultraviolet. Um, why not have one? Wouldn't that be kind of mind-blowing to be able to see those extra colours that aren't there? Absolutely, it would be amazing. There was a biohacker who implanted magnets uh, under his fingertips. Is this the guy that can detect north? It, not just detect north, he can feel electromagnetic fields. Mm. Isn't that cool? Shocks. That is cool. I don't know if it's cool or disconcerting. Like, I don't know if I went my whole life without being able to experience something, and all of a sudden I could experience it everywhere. Yeah, I mean, you know, they they do get weaker the further they are from the source. So, obviously, this is a kind of a crude thing. He's literally just implanted magnets under his fingertips. But how the, are they connected to his nerves, though? How does he feel? They're not. The magnets physically move 
in the presence of an electromagnetic field and your fingertips are so packed with nerves that you can feel that. So he can feel electromagnetic fields through the movement in the very tips of his fingers. See, as someone that used to have an implant in my chest, that sounds well annoying. Because if I did pec flies or something at the gym, I could feel it shift under my skin and it was just uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, you can't feel these moving around like up and down your fingers. We're talking oh, about... Yeah, I, could, I could literally feel this shift across my muscle. Oh, grim. No, we're talking about, you know, tiny, almost imperceptible movements, but because there's so many nerves in your fingertips, you can detect it as well. As I say, speaking as someone who's um, worked with very powerful magnetic fields, that is not a thing you want to take near an MRI scan. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it obviously raises kind of a whole bunch of, uh, like... Well, it raises things complications you'd have to be aware for of. medical treatments as well, then, doesn't it? Yeah. Hmm. You know, that would be no different for a person that was deaf suddenly getting hearing. You want to be telling them, by the way, things can get too loud. Yeah. So, I mean, I suppose that's that's a point to touch on, because um, I think, as we've mentioned before, a lot of people probably assume that transhumanism is more about the kind of cybernetic angle. And they'll have seen things like um, it's Professor Kevin Warwick, isn't it? Um, the guy who had yeah. the, the thing in his arm where he could open open doors. Um, and I think people kind of see it as cyborgs, that kind of direction. But. Um, maybe more to kind of Leah's area of expertise. Surely there's um there's there's now we seem it looks like there's a lot more opportunity to do stuff using genomic intervention. So um, things like CRISPR and things like that. I know we've got those a bit further down in our list. I do. You know I'll be honest. This I find far more fascinating because we all know that robotics can work. We all know that machinery is a thing. That that maybe slightly more mind-blowing than guest gears and servos exist is that it can interface with a nervous system and take signals which is fascinating we'll get onto that later but genetic engineering i think is actually such a deeper rabbit hole than cybernetic upgrades as it were there's there's yeah. so much more potential there in terms of post-humanism or transhumanism in that it's not changing parts of a person it's changing the actual person and what makes them a person that is is quite mind like the potential there is insane yeah and i think it's very desirable from a medical perspective um certainly because you can potentially eliminate disease especially diseases that are genetically quite simple like cystic fibrosis and huntington's and sickle cell Uh, all of those things have the potential to be changed with technology like CRISPR. um and i think for me personally that's the most kind of exciting aspect of of transhumanism and, and things like that where you can change people's lives for the better it, medically by quite by then quite simple interventions yeah do you think perhaps it's become necessary to an extent with humans as a species in that we have almost removed ourselves from a natural um selection cycle we've made it so easy for humans in the right conditions obviously not everywhere in the world but in certain mm. developed countries to not die that we're, we're living into severe dementia, we're living into horrible living conditions. Um, you know, euthanasia is not allowed in most countries, developed nations, um, or certainly not assisted dying forms of euthanasia. I um, think that's going to change. Yeah, no, I mean, we'll, we'll move on to that as its own topic um, at some point in the conversation. But do you think it's perhaps necessary that we, t- not just desirable, but necessary that we take evolution into our own hands because we've almost removed ourselves from the natural selection in that things that would previously have killed people, um, they still exist, but they're no longer killing people. So cancer, as an example, people in Britain now have more than a 50, there's more than 50% survival rate for cancer. More people survive it than die from it. That's amazing. We can save more people than we lose. But that means that humanity is very unlikely to ever develop a natural answer to it humanity is never going to evolve past it because it's not calling the people that have it and then the people that don't have it are surviving so the genes that are susceptible Mm -hmm. are being passed on whereas in a natural selection environment those genes would be being called Uh, i think we are still under a certain degree of natural selection simply because people still do die before they get to breeding age from things like disease so i i I think I, i agree with you yes to some extent but i think there's there's maybe an element of both there's an element of continuing evolution and there certainly should be an element of genetic engineering there as well because yes certainly CRISPR can be used um potentially can be used for things like cancer and and yeah diseases that strike later in life as well yeah what is CRISPR so it's a very precise way of changing the DNA basically it utilizes a method that's used by bacteria um it's basically an immune response against um viruses um and we've been able to kind of 
to utilize this for our own purposes. It's very, it's very precise. It goes to the exact part of the genome you want and basically edits the DNA. Right. Um, I think that's as, as complex an example or, or explanation as I'm <laughs> going to process. I'm sure that there is, you could speak for hours on how it actually works, but I suppose that's the TLDR. Yeah, pretty much. It's also, yeah, it's not quite my area of expertise, but, um, but it's certainly more precise than what we're currently using for, for example, GMOs, where you just sort of insert some genes and hope that the cells take them up and incorporate it into the genome and you hope they go to, into the right part of the genome. So the important thing with CRISPR is that it's very precise. But do you think that, so the original question, do you think it's perhaps e either is or will become necessary that artificial intervention regarding the evolution of humanity becomes uh, a practice because we are increasingly removing ourselves from the natural process? Yeah, to some degree. And we're, we're, yeah, we're continuing to move ourselves away from natural selection. And as that sort of becomes more apparent, yeah, we will have more need for these interventions. Yeah. And I mean, that it also brings up like we've got a whole section on ethics to have later on. But it brings up the ethics of which which diseases do we cure? Because, mm. you know, there, there are things like Down syndrome where people don't want to be defined as, as by their Down syndrome or they don't think their Down syndrome is something that should be changed or that you know that people with down syndrome and they people with down syndrome do have every right that someone without down syndrome has but is it if it's is it's the perception is it a negative trait or not is it something that we would wish to quote unquote cure or not and then what kind of psychological effect would this have on people who do have it are they they somehow less than other people i mean the narrative is no there's it's there's an interesting um there's two interesting things I'd like to raise here. So, so one thing is there's a very good video that we'll put in the show notes um, from CGP Grey, which is specifically on the topic of death. It's not on a specific um, uh, specific disease, but it's, 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 a, it's a philosopher's argument about this idea of living with this terrible dragon. And, you know, you get used to people having to be fed to the dragon. And, and then the idea is the dragon is death. And you go through this whole, like, well, if we could defeat the dragon, why wouldn't we? Which is a very kind of transhumanist argument. I can't remember the name of the philosopher, but maybe Ollie knows the story I'm alluding to. Um, it's not Aubrey de Grey, is it? Might be. I, I couldn't tell you, but it's, it's, it's about this giant dragon that, that feeds on, on the populace and, and people get used to it over time. And then people are like, there's no way we can defeat the dragon. And there's a cult of the dragon and this kind of stuff. But there's a very good video version of it that I've seen. Um, because humans can only process things in metaphors. Let's fill everything down to a metaphor. It is a good way of of showing the argument. It's it's like why don't we do this? Um, but there's also um, what's very interesting is the um, so I've done I I spent some time uh, I spent six months um, uh, working with um, a, a, a drug company, and when I was there, I saw some talks um, from from pe people who work with you know drug, developing drugs and stuff. And one of the things that's really interesting is. Um, like health economics so the economics of so, so like we were discussing here the ethics where you say well obviously we, if we could click our fingers and cure everyone of all the diseases we would want to um but you have a finite pool of resources so it there's a whole kind of thing about the the ethics of you know sh should we be focusing more on these um medicines that are ex like a lot of a lot of medicines that get focused on are things that extend life but actually you have a lot of people you still have people dying young from certain diseases so surely those should be a thing you care about more and then when when you have when you have to weigh it up if you're if you're say the nhs who have a certain amount of buying power then you have well we can buy this drug that will cure children who could potentially live for 50 years or we have this drug that that costs the same but it cures people in their 60s which one do we pick and i just I'm not exactly sure <laughs> if if we should talk on the ethics of that right now but i just i think it's an interesting point that there is there's a lot going on here that people don't always weigh up the you know, I, I think most people would agree that progress is a good thing, right? But sometimes it's limited by the things we currently have available. I think this is. Um, I, I've I've heard similar kind of um, uh, kind of thoughts before on this kind of thing. I've always said though that in regard to transhumanism, I think they're irrelevant, right? Because that's the situation that we have now, without any uh, kind of adherence to transhumanist thought. You know, we we have less resources than we need to heal all the sick people we have. Hmm. So it's like the old thing of, you know, if we develop these technologies, there'll be rationing of the technologies. And you think, well, yeah, you know, that's the situation we have now. If we develop these new technologies, so if we develop, uh, say, in vitro um, screening for a whole bunch of horrible genetic conditions, and then using a technology like CRISPR to, you know, selectively gene edit uh, embryos, 
or you know if you're doing IVF the ability to like read the genome of, of all of your potential implants and say um, okay well you've got seven um, you know fertilized eggs uh, six of them have got various genetic um, traits that will lead to possibly conditions nasty conditions later in their life uh, one of them doesn't that's the one we're going to implant you know we already have rationing problems with medicine kind of more advanced technology, more advanced drugs, and more advanced genetic techniques aren't going to solve the rationing problem, but they will make it easier. I mean, when you think about conditions like, someone mentioned cystic, cystic fibrosis, how much is spent on a, for, for, over the course of a year, how much money does the NHS spend on someone with cystic fibrosis? I'd imagine it's probably a, a fairly large sum of money. So if you could treat cystic fibrosis at the stage pre-birth, if you could edit that genome pre-birth uh, and say your child was at risk of cystic fibrosis, we're going to feed them a quick, um, I don't know, um, uh, you know, a, a retrovirus to, to edit their genome so they won't be at risk of cystic fibrosis. That kid now grows up, doesn't have cystic fibrosis. Yes, the intervention costs money, but how much money are you saving through not having to treat that person every year? And it's not just a you. The you here is very broad. How much money is society saved? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. So how much money could the NHS save, for instance, if we solve just one of these really, really horrible conditions? You know, the absolutely debilitating conditions. Now, one of the like common counter-arguments to that is when people say, well, surely you should love your child equally, regardless of what, of what condition it may or not be born with. And the answer is, you still can, but the child's yeah. not been born yet. You're not loving it any less because it may have had a condition. You're not... It, you're just giving it a better quality of life. Someone who's grown up and lived with genetic conditions that are not currently curable, that give me pain every single day and make mundane tasks difficult, that prevent me from being able to walk around a zoo. Yes, these things should be stopped. I would consider adopting instead of having... I, I would. You know, I, I, I like the romantic idea of having your own genetic line and your own little mini you that has certain traits that it carries on, but why would I want to inflict that condition upon another living being? There is a strong chance I would pass this condition on, and surely that's a good argument on its own for adopting someone or pressing with such procedures. Yeah, see, I've never understood the, the general argument against that either. It's, it's a case of if this technology was widely available on the NHS, and if you were going to have... Assuming that anyone listening to this has an NHS... Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, assume you've got this, and and you and your partner are thinking of having kids, and you go and see your doctor, and he just does a very, you know, takes a, a, a blood sample and comes back to you and says, by the way, one of you is a carrier for this condition. Um, so if you're planning on having kids, we can just ensure that your child doesn't have that condition. If you have that option, why would you not take it? Why would you roll the dice with your child having a debilitating condition when you have the option not to? So if these technologies do become available, you know, of course we should we should take them. So, Leah, as as a biologist, can you think of any reason not to? No, Just, I, I no, yeah, that's I, a really simple <laughs> answer. <laughs> Single syllable. That's an amazing that example. Clear for anybody. <laughs> No. Yeah, I, I agree with like what you've just said. I, I if if you have a chance to eliminate a disease that's really awful, then if you would do it. And the argument about you know loving your child any less it was like, well, no, you love the child, so you don't want them to suffer. So yeah. So I, I suppose some of that comes into play where at what point you draw a line between diseases and traits. Is autism a disease or is it simply a trait? Is you know, uh, I'm sure there are some idiots out there that would describe certain skin colours as undesirable traits that should be edited out. You know, they, those, like, obviously, there's a very clear contrast between those two examples, but at what mm. point is something classified as one and at what point is something culturally perceived as the other? OK, um, I, I think that that can be quite a difficult line to find. So I would personally... Obviously not between the two examples, but no. <laughs> what traits are going between? between traits and, and diseases because there are some yeah of, there would be some versions of genes that work slightly less well than others but they're not pathological and that's kind of a spectrum right but i would personally stick with things that are clearly diseases um like the cancers like the cystic fibrosis like the huntington's and i think those things are all quite they're quite obvious when you see them like it's obvious what would you say the see. definition of a disease is then if it's if it causes significant pain or distress or like it stops you from being able to live your life properly then i guess it's a disease right 
I mean, there's the whole slippery slope argument with these things. But like Leah said, it's not a case of we're we're talking about genetic engineering to kind of just create a superior human. We're talking about you know one Which lab. We will. Well, we're not yet. Yeah, we will. We'll but, talk about it. <laughs> but one lab is going to come up with uh, a cure for, say, Huntington's disease. Another lab is going to come up with a cure for cystic fibrosis. You know, it's going to be individual um, achievements on individual diseases. And the whole slippery slope argument, you know, that's something society is going to have to talk about which ones we allow through and which ones we don't. But I think yeah. I think a lot of these are kind of quite obvious. So if someone comes up with a uh, an in vitro cure for cystic fibrosis, you know, I think there's going to be, yeah, that's we're going to need to talk about this. Yeah, that's going to need to go to an ethics committee. It's going to need to be very heavily researched. But why would we not? You know, just because we cure cystic fibrosis doesn't mean that we're going to eliminate um all autistic people you know yeah exactly it, it's it's a it's going to be an individual you know every single change that we are able to make will have to be assessed separately um and you know yeah there are idiots out there i mean there was a thing a couple of years ago with um uh far-right christians in america trying to find the gay gene with the obvious hope that they would be able to genetically engineer the gay away um i mean luckily far-right christian fundamentalists don't have access to good scientists <laughs> um but you know that's that was a serious thing that they wanted to do and you think that if it turns out that there is a gene for you know conditions such as you know if there's a condition for being gay i mean i don't i have absolutely no idea whether there is or not you don't want to call it gay being gay a condition dude. it's really hard to, <laughs> well, you to know what i mean you know what i mean if 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 being gay is linked to some expression of your genome there are going to be religious fundamentalists who are want to who are going to want to check to make sure their children aren't gay. But well, these are the same religious fundamentalists who would decry genetics as or altering it as altering with God's intended design. Um, yeah. And there would be a complete hypocrisy and dichotomy of thought there, a complete cognitive dissonance involved in, in saying, "Oh, well, God designed people, but this needs to be changed." So you're saying God got it wrong? Yeah, look at Trump's followers. Cognitive dissonance is not a problem for these guys. <laughs> I think a lot of these people would argue that it's a choice and that it's not genetic. Yeah, that's also true. But then, yeah. then that's, that goes against the general narrative. The general narrative is that something like homosexuality is not a choice. I mean, isn't, isn't pretty much everything considered a mutation, though? I mean, yeah. what's the definition of a mutation? Well, uh, Le Leah can tell you what the definition of a mutation is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a mutation is usually, all right, so the way DNA is structured, you've all kind of, you've seen the double helix structure, right? It kind of looks like a twisted ladder. Yes. The rungs on the ladder are called nucleotides. Um, they pair up with one another, and that's how the two strands kind of get together. Um, and what happens is every set of three nucleotides codes for one amino acid, and chains of amino acids make proteins. So if there is a change in one of the bases, one of the rungs on the ladder to a different one, that potentially can change the protein, which then changes the function. Um, or that, it may that's or how may you not get happen. different protein tissues in, in an anatomy, is it? So that's how you would get um, muscle tissue and, and organ tissue and skin yeah. tissue. Yeah. So if there's a base change, so what, one base swaps for another, that uh, changes the underlying, that changes or potentially changes the protein sequence. Or if a base is deleted, or if a base is added, those are the three basic types of genetic mutation. And would would sort of like CRISPR or genetic engineering be involved in manually making these changes? Yeah. So, but it wouldn't be classed as a mutation because it's artificial. Um, Does a mutation have to be natural? Um, both. The, yeah, the way I've all, always used the term mutation is is a natural mutation. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, if you're physically changing it yourself, then it's. Yeah, I guess I, I so would. How, how do natural mutations occur then? If if you've got two sets of DNA that are, that are merging, right, and neither of these two sets of DNA contain what this third combined set of DNA is going to create, how how does a mutation actually happen? Because the transcription process isn't a hundred percent accurate. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's a typo. Yeah, precisely. It's just a mistake that happens when DNA when cells uh, split and the, the DNA sort of goes off into two different sets, it, it, it's very easy for mistakes to happen. Well, not very easy, but reasonably easy. Considering how much DNA is in an organism, um, it's very likely. Is there any kind of research or statistic on how often mutations occur within the human populace? And at which point they're going to give us superpowers? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I think... Yeah, well, mutation rates vary depending on the gene um, and depending on the environment. So certain populations may be more prone to mutations than others. Mm. 
maybe not all we, we don't have the facts yeah well theoretically, theoretically yeah if you were living somewhere you know with a very high amount of radiation then definitely but generally in practice i would suggest probably not i mean actually because well, actually there's a place in iran i can't remember what it's called but where there is quite high uh radioactivity and you would expect sort of higher rates of cancer and higher rates of mutation but apparently there isn't at all so so radioactivity does theoretically cause increased rates of, of change and mutation um how is it is it the the energy getting into a cellular level is it is it sort of the rate i don't i'm i'm, I'm literally spouting pseudo scientific i do not understand it uh, well so the, as a physicist what happens the um radiation comes in and uh so there's various types of radiation there's the three types alpha beta and gamma but generally what happens is you're having um uh free radicals occurring and they can affect the f- free radical i only ever hear the word free radical in like hippie detox diets about you <laughs> yeah that, there, there, that is a problem what so, so, is a free radical a free radical is is um uh, f- f- sorry the best example is probably just with that alpha alpha radiation which is an alpha particle is a helium nucleus basically it's this big thing and it goes in and it, and it needs electrons and it grabs the electron and therefore affects things around it so it'll maybe grab the electrons from the molecules in the cell causing a change in the cell yeah and then beta radiation is um, essentially electrons, uh, and gamma radiation is essentially um, so, uh, light. What the radiation does is it causes a molecular change in the cell, rather than necessarily a beginning of biological change. It changes on a molecular level, which has a knock-on effect into the biological nature of it. Yeah, because it can knock it can it can knock out um, like part of the DNA strand. It can affect that that transcription process. Yeah. That that I think that is a simplified answer that that is good enough for my simple brain. Um, so, so one one thing I suppose is interesting to mention about this kind of idea of of, of changing your body bodily autonomy. Um, we we've got a, a list of various types of media representation, and one in there that I I I'm, I'm, I really enjoy is the Culture series. Um, and this is a series of books. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I made you read Use of Weapons recently. Uh, yes, but I was I was already reading the culture series, and I, there's there's a, a there's a I, I would say, go so far as to say it's probably spoiler free in that it doesn't include anything from the books, but there are notes on the culture, which is a description of kind of the world in which this happens. So it's it's on a kind of it's on a galactic scale, and the culture is a society that the idea is they exist like now because there's definitely a book in the night where they go back to like the 1970s on Earth, but um they have humans, and and humans in this sense are six or seven races i think it is that have been genetically engineered to a point where they can all interbreed so they're essentially one species um but it's via genetic engineering and uh, there's a lot of stuff in there that, that i suppose i mean ollie and leo will be able to comment on on how how that lines up with kind of transhumanist ideals but um it's it's the idea that uh so so for example people can by releasing the right um hormones in their in their into their bloodstream or, or, or chemicals into their bloodstream which they can control they can choose to go from male to female and female to male. And it's a process that takes, I think, I don't know, six months, a year or something, but it's very common within their society. And yeah. there is an inherent equality because if everyone can spend, if mo- nearly everyone spends time as a, as a woman and a man or in between, and therefore understands that there are no real differences between people. I mean, there are differences in physical manifestations of, of how they look, but fundamentally all people are people and so so that kind of makes helps equalize the society i mean because... all people are people but all people have different hormone balances regardless of their sex or gender and therefore that alters things so this is where you get into the questions of free will i think the thing with the culture is that it, it because everyone or pretty much everyone has spent time as a man and a woman the whole idea of kind of sexism seems pointless you know once you've spent time as a woman it seems ridiculous to them as a very as even as a concept to to tolerate sexism it, it just seems like nonsensical you know um i love the culture series i mean there's one character in it who decides to spend some time as a tree um i can't remember <laughs> I which one that it. is he, he's the head of the um the their kind of uh, intelligence agency but he's just decided to be a tree for a bit and everyone's reaction to that is kind of do you know what yeah go for it man you be a tree and it's it's also a, it's a world where so the average person lives for hundreds of years um and, and and could theoretically just live forever, but most people just decide after a time that it's their time, and and their form of euthanasia is normally just to be fired into a star, which I think is a pretty cool way to go. <laughs> well, I mean, they're post-human and they're post-scarcity as well, which is a big yeah. thing. Um, but I mean, that's that's a, a really interesting example of a properly post-human society. 
I mean, we cannot, at the moment, we can't really imagine what it would be like to live in a society that is post-scarcity. Oh, yeah, I think that's one of the biggest factors in the culture as a setting, is that the post-scarcity means that people can afford to do whatever they want and have whatever luxury they want and not strive for anything because they're post-scarcity. Yeah, and there they is have to find something else to do with There is enough space, there is enough food, there is enough money, there is enough entertainment, there is enough everything. Yeah, they have, they have the ability to essentially make planets. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so, in other media representations, one thing that we touched on earlier without ever mentioning it by name, in regards to genetic editing and removing of diseases, is Gattaca. How do we right, feel Phil. about Gattaca as a representation of one of the potential dangers a society may face as a result of such procedures being available? Um, I think you've got an inherent problem with stuff like Gattaca. I love the movie. I think it's a really, really good movie. But I think there's a problem when you come to fictional portrayals of advanced technology in that it's not actually that interesting when the technology works and is widely available to everyone and everyone's happy. Stories, good stories, thrive on conflict. So when we look at most forms of advanced technology in in kind of media, it's almost always looking at the downsides of things. So, you know, uh, very rarely is AI portrayed as anything except HAL and Skynet and, and that kind of thing. And genetic engineering always comes along as kind of Gattaca and Splice and all that kind of stuff. Um, very rarely do do they say, you know, oh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence is prevalent. It's everywhere. Everyone has a personal AI that looks after them. And actually, everything's really kind of good. So Gattaca's good, but I don't think it's realistic. If that technology is available, then people will want to use it. I think Gattaca is realistic in the sense that it's available, but it's not available in a post-scarcity society. We live in a capitalist society, the majority of the world, where things are made available to people based on resource. I think it's almost certain that for a time at least, that should, should such procedures become available, they would only become available to a privileged few. And then you would get the same problems presented in Gattaca. Yeah. All technologies are available to the rich first because they're, they're too expensive. But they filter down. They always filter down. This is the thing. Because if you are a do, company... Do they? Because that are... sounds like trickle-down economics. No, they're no. very different things. Like it's, Yeah, it's very much not. Think of a technology that we have now, that you have now. At one point, only the very rich had that technology. So you look at you look at smart uh, you look at um, cellular phones. Originally, the people who, only people who had mobile phones were rich yuppies, and they were a status symbol, and they were very expensive. And now, if you look at what's happening in Africa, Africa has skipped the the cabled internet. Essentially, they are moving to mobile internet because mobile phones are so prevalent in Africa that it doesn't make sense for people to invest in a wide scale cabled infrastructure when they're moving, they're skipping that stage and going straight to mobile internet. Because if you're a company that is selling mobile phones, you can sell mobile phones to the top, say, 1 million richest people on the planet. And you'll make a lot of money doing that. But you will make a lot more money if you can sell those mobile phones to the richest billion people on the planet. But is that not where you get tiered products and services? Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. So even if some of these procedures become available to everybody, it will always only be some of them. It no, it will. All. It will always be all of them. It will just there, there'll be a lead-in. So, for instance, smart. You know, mobile phones only for the rich to start with. Now everyone has a mobile phone. Smartphones only for the rich to start with. Now smartphones are you know common as muck. Is this working on the theory that eventually there's no more rich people to sell to? Yeah, exactly. You know, the people who are producing this want to sell as much of this as possible, and it's not often even. It's it's not even about sometimes the raw profit. It, you know, it's about market share. You want to have your your product out there as much as possible so yes certainly the rich will have access to gene editing technology for their children first because they'll go to private clinics in nations where it's not regulated you know that's that's going to happen i can't see any way that that wouldn't happen but once that technology is out there and once that technology is stable what you'll see is the national health services of advanced nations will start saying okay we'll allow this procedure okay we'll allow this procedure you know that technology will get wider spread especially since all of these technologies, they're not developed in secret labs by supervillains. They're developed in universities by people who want to share that information. What that about Big Pharma, Oliver? What about Big Pharma? What about what, Big Pharma? What about Big Pharma? <laughs> Big Pharma is a perfect example, actually, because you look at what happens with drugs. So any drug that is developed in, I don't know how long the, uh, the, the copyright period on it is, 
20 years, I think, is the average patent length. 20 years. So there we, we have a 20-year lead time. Whatever drug now is super expensive and available to only the richest of people in 20 years' time will be free to anyone pro- to, for anyone to produce. And is that time there so that that company has an incentive to invest in the research because of the sheer amount of cost of the research? So they can yeah. make a profit for an amount of time that but eventually that's the has idea. to be available to everybody. But is there not a danger of the Mickey Mouse trick? Which is? So the Mickey Mouse trick is a copyright thing where yeah. Disney's copyright on Mickey Mouse yeah. should have run out years ago. Hmm. But Disney made a case and lobbied and had enough money that they circumvented copyright law or they, they, they had um, annulments or agreements written into it because it was so, so relevant to the company as an identifier, as a brand, as a source of revenue that the company would suffer enormously were it to be made into the public domain. So yeah. they had enough money to stop it becoming public domain. Is there not a danger that these companies can make so much money that they can prevent these things from becoming public domain? Yes. There, there is always that danger, but within the current system, um, yeah. so again, having spent time with AstraZeneca, <laughs> um, yeah, there are tw- patents are 20 years for drugs, and you, make, you, you get the patent when you invent the drug. That's before all the testing, so you lose about seven years to the research process. So you essentially have 13 years, maybe less, depending on how well it goes, um, to 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 have the exclusive patent on that drug. How how would another company even get hold of the the recipe, as it were, if you just don't give it to them? Uh, if if you never gave it to them, that then then that there's a chance they just might find it. Like either, all these companies are that, that there have been very few new drugs developed, um, in in the kind of traditional sense. A lot of stuff we're seeing now is like gene therapies, etc. Um, and and the yeah the, the thing is basically they have vats and vats of different chemicals and they're just mixing them all together and seeing if they have an effect on say like a bacteria they want to kill and then they take like so so you, you would test millions and millions of, of combinations of chemicals and then from that you may get say a thousand that seem to be doing the thing you want and then you have to have a look at them and like at, you can rule out a certain number because they're just super poisonous to humans and would never work um and then you rule out others because they're not actually as effective as you thought and you get down to a certain number of uh of drugs you want to test and then those go on to further trials and there are some things you can do like sometimes something is poisonous but you can encapsulate it there are these very clever molecular chemists who will go around and reformulate drugs into ways where he, like you can encapsulate something so that it's safe to ingest and then when it gets to the target site it's very poisonous to that thing like cancer cells for example um I mean, yeah, like we said, it's not impossible that that could one day happen and we could have this situation we have with copyright. But I think there's been enough pushback against the idea of big pharma and stuff like that, that we have got to this good equilibrium where there's this 20 year patent time. Um, And then there are some things you can do for extensions. If you can prove that a drug works well in children and can therefore help children, you can get an extension. I think it is maybe five years to the patent. So there's a lot of money is thrown into that kind of side of things um, when they're like, oh, we've got this drug, but can we use it somewhere else? And then sometimes you have things like the Viagra drug where, uh, it was a design, designed to stop heart attacks, but fortuitously had this other effect and they could market that and sell that. And so they still had that patent. And so when you talk about um, that, that, that drug, you call it Viagra. This is the thing like, um, so uh, you, you, once, once, once uh, it's out of patent, anyone can make it really cheaply. You can go down to the supermarket and you can buy penicillin, aspirin, ibuprofen, and it will cost you like, I don't know, 16p for 16 caplets or something. That's like a penny yeah. a, a caplet. Ridiculous. Um, but 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 the, but the companies still throw an enormous amount of advertising. It's like, oh, Nurofen is so specially formulated. Nurofen will go straight to the pain. Yeah, and the it's majority similar. of it is the exact same active ingredients, and that there's yeah. no difference at all. It's just a brand. There are some arguments for encapsulation, but like you can basically buy knockoff uh, Nurofen t- tablets for about thirty p, uh, whereas Nurofen tablets are like three quid for the same amount of drug. And, and it's there's no actual thing. difference in the chemical composition of the product. No, um, one of my um, colleagues uh, at Manchester, uh, I was I was feeling a bit sick once, and I was like, "Oh, what what would you recommend?" He was like, "Don't bother buying Lemsip. Go get yourself, go get yourself um, ibuprofen, some aspirin, and a can of Coke." <laughs> it's like it's got because the thing that Lemsip has in it, um, a lot of the Lemsip capsule, capsules have in is caffeine, so that's why you feel a bit better with it over the equivalent drugs. And he was just like, "Have a can of Coke, you'll feel the same," <laughs> you know. <laughs> so back onto media representation of it, Oliver. Your argument is that. These products or procedures will eventually be available to everybody, and therefore, could Gatska not be showing an in-between stage? Though? So, yeah, it could always be problems. So you say, 
you're saying that the media always focuses on the conflict caused by new technologies because without conflict there is no story and without story there is no well there's no product there's no media. yeah exactly and and you know a, a lot of the time they're they're exploring these technologies to find something interesting to talk about them um so you know what's interesting with gattaca is that you've got a, a kind of an entrenched underclass who aren't genetically engineered um who are forbidden from doing certain things uh, even when they're quite capable of doing them like the the hero who eventually basically tricks uh the upper class and gets into space while wearing a suit which is weird um, but one of the arguments about that as well would be that that perhaps the, the original person would have been more suited to that role or more capable in that role. She's capable yeah. of doing it, but the other person would have been capable of doing it better, and therefore there would, would have been a reason to hire them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things, though, is that we are in such a globalized society now as well that if you wanted to have, if you had a nation that enacted a very strict law like that, where they restricted certain top jobs for those who had been genetically altered. Well, in Gattaca, it's not restricted by law. In fact, it's illegal to restrict it. It's just the company like, discriminates subtly, or they, they, they come up with another reason that they should have hired the other person. I thought in Gattaca, the whole thing was he was excluded based on no, his No, no, no. The company chooses to hire based on that, but it's illegal for them to do so. That is actually part of the plot of Gattaca. Uh-huh. They're not allowed to do it, but everybody does it anyway. They just cite another reason. The yeah, same yeah. way somebody might, in modern society, choose not to hire a woman because they think that, oh, well, they're going to need maternity leave at some point, despite the fact this person may never want to be pregnant, um, and choose to hire a man instead, but they would cite another qualification on the CV as the real reason, regardless of their actual motives. I think as well there's a certain amount of practicality would counter that. So, you know, you, you talk about, uh, for instance, um, not hiring women because, um, you know, they can hire a man instead. I think, yeah, some companies will do that. Some companies we know do do that. But those companies really are losing out. They're going to lose out on women who might be fantastically um, talented to other companies who are then going to get those women because they don't have discriminatory hiring practices. Yeah, but I mean, to take it into to the realms of transhumanism, when there are clear, not saying that it's possible, but it, you know, in, in the case of Gattaca, it, it's identified that some people are hired because they are less likely to fall ill and need time from work because their genetics are stronger. Yeah. If that was yeah. identifiable, then they're not missing out they're getting a better candidate genetically yeah i can see what you mean yeah um and yeah that that i guess would always be a problem wouldn't it is that it's like any kind of hiring practice like that i mean like you say in the film it's illegal um one of the things we constantly need is basically support for the laws we do have a lot of this stuff you know it, it's it's powerful stuff a lot of the the technologies we're talking about and if people do use it recklessly you know we are going to have problems under our current system you know, we've got one set of problems. Under the system we will have when some of these technologies become widely available, we don't even know what the system will be at that point. Um, I mean, some of the technologies, stuff like anti-aging for a start, the anti-aging technologies, if we don't change our society, they will not survive uh, people who live three or four times longer. You know, our society as it is at the moment cannot cope with people that live to 300 years old, not if the whole population is doing it. But society does change based on these technologies. You know, these, these technologies do change society. Um, whether society is going to change quick enough, I mean, we're already kind of living in an, uh, an interesting time uh, globally in that we are you know, rapidly destroying the planet. Whether we're even going to get to the point where our societies can still produce these technologies. Okay, so to, to, to sort of wrap up the whole media point, when you say that they, the media's job when imagining these situations is to create friction and stories and, and foresee potential pitfalls, I attended a very good... Um, panel at Manchester Literary Festival a couple of years ago uh, called Biopunk, where they were uh, producing a set of short stories. Um, the, the anthology was called Biopunk, Stories from the Far Side of Research, and they paired authors with scientists. And they had some very strict criteria in that the, the stories had to be based on what was theoretically possible from the science. Yeah. Um, and there are some things in there that you might think are a complete stretch, like people surviving in a vacuum. <laughs> um uh, there's also an example, uh, one of the stories is about a, per, uh, a person breeds with an orangutan um, and it creates uh, its own little subspecies, which is then mainly used for manual labor. And it's like, should these these new creatures have better rights than that? Um, and one thing that it really did was it, it opened my eyes to the role of literature and art in portraying these things to the public in that a lot of the scientists on the panel seemed very surprised at some of the questions and ideas presented by the authors. And the author said, well, could that theoretically lead to this, which could lead to this? And like, well, I guess so, but I've never thought of that. And it seemed to me that some of these scientists were so focused on just making it work 
there is a problem, they're trying to find a solution, that they don't think further than that. They don't actually, a lot of them don't so it seem to think of the ramifications beyond it sometimes. And that's perhaps where the role of authors and artists and media representation does take part. Maybe that's the, that's the job of it. Yeah, I can certainly see that. I mean, media and, and you know, um, fiction is, is a way that we can explore and talk about these issues. Um, I don't think it's media's job to portray these things negatively. I think that it's easier to portray them negatively than it is to portray them positively. Well, I think it's literature's job to explore it. Yeah, yeah, that seems reasonable. I know we've talked about gene editing and CRISPR, but Leah, is there more you'd like to say on like life extension diet uh, and drugs and things like that? That's not my area of expertise as much as genetics, although I think yeah. those things all will play a role. I assure you, you probably know more than we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously those things are always improving, right? Surgery and, uh, yeah drugs and everything and i think that will continue to play a very important role and i guess you could put that under the, the kind of broader transhumanism umbrella yeah so i suppose with like the the, the life extension stuff we're kind mm. of people always seem to feel like we're hitting up against the maximum possible human lifespan but we still seem to be extending it mm. every few years um and then and then like with diet and stuff i think now now we're getting to the point i think this is we mentioned this earlier where we have the problems we're facing are almost problems of our own success. Many of our diseases are like we, we have a problem. We have a problem with obesity because we yeah. now, at least in the Western world, are almost in that post scarcity when it comes to food. It's not not one hundred percent. Like not every single person has enough food to eat, but the yeah. average person definitely has more than enough calories a day. Oh yeah, yeah. depends where in the country <laughs> you are, mate, or where in the world. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Like I'm talking specifically about this is a Western problem. We don't have obesity as much mm -hmm. in, in 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 other countries. Um, but like, in, especially in America and the UK, the average person can easily and cheaply get high calorie foods that are quite bad for them. It, and and our, our, we haven't evolved to deal with that. It happened way too quickly for our evolution. And that, that's the problem. Like, like you, you, food, for food and the desire to eat is, is such a key part of who we are. Um, and, and we've, for, because, you know, we used to be hunter gatherers, we used to have to survive on a lot less um, calories da daily than we have now. And then we kind of we moved into cities and we, we started making bread that can keep the average peasant going. And now we're at this point where it's it's almost it becomes uh, the realm of the rich to be healthy because they're the people who have the time to, to, to go to the gym more. And they're, they're the people who have the time for salads and things, and the money to pay for these things that are more expensive, because now you can really cheaply churn out. I can't remember the brilliant. Um, I think it's the first episode of a or second episode of um, Crash Course World History with John Green, where he's talking about how. It's absolutely amazing that he can go and buy a 69 cent cheeseburger. It's like, think about all of the, the stuff, the how far technology has to have come to make it possible to buy a cheeseburger for 69 cents and it have like 700 calories in it. Um, so, so we have problems there with the, a lot of our problems we're facing now are kind of us having to retrain how we think. The great thing about being human is that we, we can, we can change how we think quicker than we can evolve. Right. That's, that's always been our benefit as a, as a species. Yeah. But I suppose, uh, yeah, I don't know if you have more to say on that kind of topic of, uh, uh, like, where do we go from here? We're at this point where yeah. we, we feel like maybe we're butting up against what we assume is our, our, our the limit of our life expectancy, but there's probably a lot more we can do to fix it. Yeah. In terms of life life extension and things like that, I think that kind of can come, that's, uh, you can solve those things with the same sort of techniques we've talked about before with sort of genetic engineering CRISPR possibly because a lot of problems with aging for example are to do with the shortening of the telomeres at the end of the chromosomes so I don't know if there's sort of if there are sort of different methods which kind of solve those problems or whether it comes down to the same things. Well I know Aubrey de Grey who's a, a, a kind of uh, very much into life extension he identified 19 problems that we know need to solve before we've basically eliminated aging and he's broken it down to these 19 specific problems. And like you say, Leo, the, the telomeres thing is one of them. Mm. Um, the, I know there's a lot of work being done, not so much on extending the time that we have, but in making the time we have uh, healthier. So, you know, instead of, uh, I mean, instead of, you know, living to 200 years, but living the last 100 years of it effectively as a 90-year-old, what people are really interested in is saying, well, actually, wouldn't it be great if you could live until, you know, live till you're 90 but as a 35 year old oh that'd be much better than simply living mm. till you're 90 exactly and, and that's what they're talking about when they talk about life extension they're not talking about extending the last years of your life they're talking about extending the middle years of your life 
So they're not mm. saying how can we be 80 for 200 years. They're saying how can we be 35 for 200 years. And that's def definitely the thing that gives me hope because you know I'm like oh I think I'm you know <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think in our lifetime we'll get to the thing where we live you know live essentially indefinitely uh, without aging. But hopefully our our you know later years will be much nicer than than, than they are for people at, at nowadays. So uh, there's always going to be improvements. We expect it to be better, but I'm hoping it will be a lot better. I mean, particularly when you look at the situation where we've got now, where we've actually got a bit of a demographic problem, where mm. our society still hasn't evolved from the society where, you know, you got old, you stopped working, uh, your kids looked after you for a couple of years, and then you died. What mm. we're talking about now is you get to that same age, you retire, and then you've got like 30 or 40 years of mm. more life. Uh, but you start getting decrepit within, you know, kind of almost as soon as you retire. You know, if you retire at the age of 65 or for you younger folks, you know, never. Um, but you're then talking about 30 years of life. Hmm. But our expectation as a society is that those 30 years of life, you're just retired. You know, you're, you're just pottering basically until the end takes you. We're going to have to come up with a different way of doing things because now that our birth rate has dropped so much, we are going to have a much larger cadre of old people. I mean, you think that 30 years at your end of your life, say, you know, 60 to 90, to balance that out on the other side, that's, you know, from when you're born to when you're 30, that's a tremendous period of time. So we're going to have to find a way to make those, those later years of life um, higher quality, you know, to, to make them better years, and particularly to make them less dependent, because we don't have the resources to look after such huge swathes of people and to give them a good quality of life. So, I mean, I think a lot of the, the life extension work is really going to be on kind of improving people's later years of life rather than, you know, trying to push for 200 years of life or 300 years of life. I mean, I think that will come, but I think that the bigger stuff will be how can we make life, you know, really excitable and enjoyable and not dependent for 70-year-olds. So in terms of biological methods and research, um... One thing that comes up in sci-fi and cyberpunk a lot, where I've no idea how viable it is, is gene splicing, will you? Mm. So the idea of creating crossbreeds of human. I mean, we can do it with trees, I know that much, but I don't know. Yeah. But, so you get, you get in some sci-fi settings, like people with animal traits, or people with fur, or people with cat's eyes that see in the dark, or people with lizards, uh, snakes' tongues that can almost... Uh, this, I don't know if it's a myth that snakes smell with their tongues or whatever, but we have some of these traits. Yeah. Like, how theoretically possible is cross-species genetic splicing? Um, because if it's possible, it's a massive rabbit hole. Because I know, uh, didn't they create glow-in-the-dark rats with jellyfish DNA? Yeah, so it's perfectly possible to transplant DNA from one species into another. So we already... glow-in-the-dark people. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, we do. <laughs> and, I mean, that's been done, you know, using traditional traditional gmo techniques um that's like that's been done for quite a while now like we can do that it does work um but there is obviously a genetic compatibility issue if you're actually trying to merge two species so it's more than a few genes that you're moving then you kind of have problems plants seem to be able to tolerate it a lot better for some reason like plant species can be quite genetically different before they can stop interbreeding with each other. So you can do things like that with trees. You can make, you know, plant varieties that are two very distinct species and, and you've made a new variety from that. It's it's not as possible with animals because the genetic compatibilities are just are just a kind of a too much really. Once you're a different species, it's very difficult to then merge because the individual just doesn't develop properly, basically. It's probably to do with Pox genes, which control body plan, which are much more complex than those. So theoretically, it, it's already theoretically possible. There are just complications. So it's a matter of circumventing those complications through further research. Possibly, possibly, yeah. But I think it's more an issue of, you know, how much can you merge? Yeah, one or two genes, fine. If you're trying to actually make kind of a new species out of two separate species, then not so much. So we're not going to get Spider-Man. I think we briefly touched on things like, like rapamycin and certain drugs that can be used for life extension. Um, I suppose the, the jury's still out on a lot of them, isn't it? Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of it's not certified. There's a lot of myths out there about certain substances as well and what, what effects they can have on longevity or medicinal purposes. And... The problem is with any field like this is that uh, charlatans take roost. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of nonsense. Yeah, and, and I mean, yeah, it's, it's one of the things, we, we always want more data, right? And 
to get a drug to the market takes, as I said, like seven to eight years, an enormous amount of effort um, and, and a lot of studies. And then it's only, but it's only when it gets out into the real world that you start finding these other things that happen with the drugs. And that's like, so, so often there are some problems with big pharma where you have things like a uh, cohorts being, cho- I mean, they often do their tests in men between the ages of about 18 and 35, who are generally relatively healthy. Um, so, that certain complications and stuff might not appear, but also they might see an increased effect with that group of people. And, and there has also been some problems with uh, the, the kind of research methods used. So, but when you actually get it out into the real world and you have doctors feeding back, that's when you start to see what these drugs can actually do and what the problems are. And rushing them causes its own problems, such as the thalidomide scandal. I mean, th- thalidomide was was more of, wasn't even rushing, it was just us literally not understanding the, that problem existed, I think. Was more of the problem there um a, a, an example of rushing is more the um i can never remember what drug it was but i think it was in london in about 2005 where they did this drug trial and they gave it to like six to eight men between 18 and 35 and one of them died because uh it, i can't remember the exact problem but it was, it was a problem with the brain and it was like a load of a load of salts being released in the brain and it caused death and, and that was because they should have done it one person make sure that person doesn't have a, a a terrible negative effect on them and then slowly increase it in size that was more of a kind of a rushed issue than thalidomide was thalidomide was really just a lack of understanding on our part sadly so the next sort of set of research and methods is cybernetics and enhancements which is your field dolly i mean that covers you know prosthetics augmented reality attachments uh technology assisted living and movement which i know you you have a vested interest in with your wife sharing some of the same conditions i have um New senses, such as the the magnetic implant or the ability to see ultraviolet or infrared, uh, but also like perhaps expanded mental capacity through implantation. Um, you know, may, maybe the matrix injection of skill. Well, some of the some of the stuff is a lot closer than other stuff. So when we're talking about prosthetics, you know, we already have prosthetics that work by nerve f- feedback. So which is know, crazy. Prosthet- how does that even? How how do we know what signals do what? Like how is that so? Well, the nerves that they're pulling it from are the nerves that control your muscle reactions. Right. So if you lose your arm at the elbow, the nerve that went to control all of the muscles of your hand still exists. It's still in your upper arm. So you can put an electrode on the skin that can pick up the signals going through that nerve. Uh, and then basically you just train the prosthetic to, to run off those signals. Now, it's not a direct neural connection. But again, that's another thing they are working on. So, um, for instance, the human-to-human networking that you mentioned. Um, back to Professor Warwick, uh, that crazy chap from uh, Reading Cybernetics Department. Um, the Warwick Implant 1 was just a, a little chip in his arm that opened the doors to his office and turned the lights on. It's really not that interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's just some, an people RFID tag. some people put their um, debit card chips under the skin, haven't they, as well? So they can simply pay for things by waving their hand. Yeah, that, that's kind of cool, but it's not really doing anything. It's really, it's just you're just carrying the RFID tag inside you rather than outside you. So, you know, it's, it's not amazing. The, the second Warwick implant, though, that was a lot sexier. Uh, that one, he actually plugged a nerve array into his median nerve in his arm, and he used it to interface his nervous system directly to a computer. So, so he could control a computer with thought? Well, he could control various things linked to that computer. So um, I actually met him back when I was doing my degree, and I asked him about this. Uh, one of his books, he talks about a, a robotic hand that he had plugged it was basically it was, in, it was on the other side of a lab. He was plugged into a computer. This robotic was hand was plugged into the computer, and he could move the robotic hand by moving his own hand. So he would move his own hand. The nerve array was picking up the signal in his nerves, translating that into the computer, which would then move the robotic hand. So what this is telling me is in Pacific Rim, when they're inside the big robots, they could have just done <laughs> it over Wi-Fi or something. Yeah. So I thought that was really cool. But he told me what was really cool was when he was able to control the robotic hand without moving his own hand. So basically, he very quickly figured out how to move the robotic hand to get it to clench and unclench its fist without making any physical movements of his own through his neural link, which just seemed exceptionally cool. And one of the really interesting things about that was before he did the experiment, he, he's, he's very good at generating a lot of publicity. And he talked to a lot of people in the, the news about it. Uh, and there was a professor of physiology at one of the big London universities who said that this experiment's going to fail. Then the nerve array simply isn't that detailed. It won't pick up the signals like he's saying it would. And that guy, the professor of physiology, was wrong. So I think there's a really big 
kind of area here for people like biohackers, which is essentially what Kevin Warwick is. He's just a tenured one. Um, there's a really big area for them to actually play with these things because we don't actually know a lot of the stuff that we think we know. So, I mean, you know, Lee was talking about um, gene splicing, and it's it's clear that, that the science of genetic editing, we are still really right at the infancy of that. You know, what we are going to know in 50 years' time about gene editing, we, we don't even have a, a clue how advanced that's going to be in 50 years' time, but it's going to be incredible. And I think the same is true with the cybernetics. So connecting our nervous systems to technology is going to be the really big one. That's going to be... Um, uh, immense improvements in prosthetics, uh, like I said, augmented reality. At the moment, we use augmented reality with, um, like you know, with our uh, screen, uh, generally held up in front of our eyes. Uh, there's no reason that in the future we couldn't have that, um, you know, integrated into us. Overlaid on the eyes, essentially. You mean? Yeah, exactly. It's like a heads-up display. Um, some of the stuff, like the expanded mental capacity and you know, learning new skills that you mentioned, Mike. I mean, we are so far away from that. Um, we don't even understand really how the brain works a lot of the time. So using technology to expand that, I think it's definitely something people are going to work on until they get it right. But I think that, you know, some of this stuff is a lot closer than other stuff. I certainly think the ability to plug in like skill chips, like um, kind of William Gibson style skill softs, you know, we are a, a long time away from that. OK, so the third one, which we're probably even further away from, is this, this idea of uploading oneself or copying a digital copy of oneself. How how theoretically viable is that? I actually got into an argument um, with a, a, a guy on this, um, a, a talk that Kevin Warwick did, um, where he was saying, you know, the, the whole idea of uploading, you know, it, it's it's an impossibility. The brain is so complex. Um, and it is, it's, you know, it's, it's ridiculously complex. But... but 100 years ago, the idea of uh, transferring images onto a screen from miles away would have been impossible and too complex. See, I don't know, because even like... back then... The, the internet the, was not a thing, you know? It wasn't a thing, but people who are working in computer science would certainly have been able to talk to you about it. Um, I think stuff like this, uploading and copying, eventually it will be possible to simulate all of the biological functions of a human body on a computer. Now, we are talking about an outrageously complex computer, uh, you know, an absolutely vast computer that we don't currently have the ability to build. But there's no reason, there's no theoretical reason that we could not do that. We just need a computer big enough. So eventually we will be able to copy the entirety of a person and run them as a simulation. I don't see that anyone's really able to argue against that if our computer gets powerful enough. Um, whether you'd want to or not, I'm not sure. Which also leads to the argument of, it, would a copy of a human being be, be the same person? Like, not really. The same way if you cloned a person, it wouldn't be the same person. It would be a copy of the person, then it would have its own lived experiences henceforth. Yeah, yeah, that, that's always the thing that's terrified me about the Star Trek teleporter, you know, the transporter. Yes. You know, if, if it deconstructs a person at one place and beams them to another place, and their pattern is held in a buffer... Or couldn't you keep on beaming new versions of that person? Yeah. Is it just killing someone and reconstructing like a new copy of the person? Yeah, I mean, how that... the lived experience is retained, etc. That, that seems terrifying to me. So we've covered you know, a bit of the biohacking. The biohacking is really where people are doing it themselves, isn't it? Where they're, yeah. in a lot of cases, they're circumventing research laws and what you're allowed to do to another human being by saying, I have bodily autonomy and therefore I can do it to myself to prove it works. Yeah. Are there any examples you know of where this has gone horribly wrong? I'm sure there are probably more than where it's gone well. Well, there was that guy recently who injected himself with, um, oh God, what was it? Was it herpes? That sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, he, he's actually just died in the last week. Um, but he, he, he injected himself, um, like he recorded himself doing this, um, and he thought he had some kind of cure, which just seems like an insanely risky way of doing things. But But, you know, if, if you look at the history of people experimenting on themselves, that's how we worked out that um, stomach ulcers were caused by bacteria. Yeah, a guy drank it, didn't he? A guy just, a guy just like, well, you don't he, believe he me, infected watch. Himself. He deliberately infected himself and then he cured himself. But, um, but yeah, that, that was, you know, that's an example of doing it right. Yeah, which can come down to a combination of luck and thoroughness. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, for example, that guy who did the, did the, uh, the the stomach ulcers was a, I think he was a physician, or at the very least, um, if not a researcher, a researcher in the area. So yeah. he he knew what he would have to do because it was only a bacterial infection. He, he knew how you could fix a bacterial infection. He obviously knew a lot about ulcers, and then he was like, "I'm just going to prove this on me because you're not allowing me to do this test." Yeah, it's very different to the kind of 
I think the problem with this kind of biohackers is there's, uh, yeah, I think there's a kind of the problem with the, the biohackers is that there's, there are some of these people who are kind of on the fringe and, and maybe don't necessarily know what they're doing. And and that's where you get these kind of stories, like you're saying, where people have gone, or, you know, they, they think they're doing something and they've, they've researched it, but maybe they don't have the background necessary to truly understand what they're doing in some cases, um, yeah. which is where the problems lie. And, but, you know, how you can't really stop these people. And statistically, some of them will come up with cool stuff. You know, there will be work coming out of the biohacker community. And also, a lot of the people in the biohacker community do do this stuff professionally as well. I mean, especially when you look at the higher end of the, the biohacker community. You know, the people who are messing around with, with custom-made bacteria or, or custom-edited bacteria. I mean, these aren't just hobbyists. These tend to be people who are doing this for a living as well, um, if only because yeah. it takes a, a particular kind of level of training to, to, to kind of get into it. But yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff that you can do as an interested biohacker that you probably can't get funding for as a researcher yeah. um, or is so marginal that perhaps, you know, you, you can't get permission to study it or maybe the ethics of it experimenting on other people aren't, you know, aren't that sound. But if you're willing to do it to yourself, go for it. Experimenting on yourself is an inherently risky business. Um, I suppose we can use that to move on to kind of general risks. Um, I think there's kind of like risk risks that are, we, we've seen in, in recent technology stories maybe that may apply not only to these kind of DIY treatments, but also to transhumanism ideas, like some of these kind of ideas that we're developing. So, Yeah, uh, I think one of the big things that we've got here is, and this comes back to the media problem, is that a lot of this stuff, people only really interact with it in media, and therefore, as far as they're concerned, it's fiction. So I've had this conversation with people where I've spoken to them about AI or gene editing, um, and they are firmly convinced that these things don't exist because they see them in the movies and that's the only place they see them. And the idea that there might be people actually working on these things is bizarre to them. So, you know, when you look at, um, I remember back at university having a conversation about the first settlement on Mars. Uh, and back then the widely held opinion amongst my friends was, you know, that's science fiction. And you think, yeah, it's science fiction until you get an Elon Musk come along. Who says, well, actually, there's no reason we can't do this, and I want to do this. It's just that no one's invested in it yet. Exactly. It's just that no one's invested in it. But when it happens, we actually have the technology to do Martian settlements right now and settlements on the moon. You know, we, we can do that. So when it happens, it's going to happen quite quickly. It's just not been done because there's not yeah. been enough of a financial incentive to do it. Yeah. And one of the problems is that humans are a bit daft on this. We tend to look before we leap. Um so when it comes to stuff like uh, Cambridge Analytica that you mentioned, the problem with Cambridge Analytica is that we all got very involved in social media uh, and we all assumed that someone somewhere was keeping an eye on all of our data and that actually just randomly sharing it to shady companies that would try and manipulate us for political gain was probably a bad thing and therefore probably illegal. But actually, you know, it's not illegal at all. Facebook can do whatever the hell they like. It's such an unregulated field uh, that Facebook handed over all of our data to another company, any company, Facebook could hand over the entirety of all of our data to North Korea tomorrow, and it would be perfectly legal. Well, because we've all consented that they can do what they want with the data. We yeah, exactly. We don't own the data the that is on Facebook servers. They do. But there's a general presumption that that would be bad. Therefore, someone has already dealt with it. You know, they've already looked at that and, just, and put some kind of law or thing in, in place to affect it. But that's not the case. Um, we had a thing with the Internet of Things a while back. Uh, do you remember that big uh, botnet that was yeah, run yeah. by devices on the Internet of Things? Because people were putting these Wi-Fi-enabled toasters in their homes and just assuming that any Wi-Fi device that they are buying is going to be safe. Otherwise, why would people be allowed to sell it? But of course, you know, it's not. Some some engineer has had the idea somewhere that we could link this up, but he's not thought, I need to build decent security into my toaster. Because who thinks that until a hacker thinks it? So how does that tie into transhumanism then? How does the lessons from Cambridge Analytica tie into the risks of transhumanism? Well, an example would be if someone starts marketing devices that are, say, um, that grant access to, um, I don't know, that grant access to your your um, your vision or augmented reality or something like that. If you are working with a shady company like Facebook, this you know this system might go wide before there's sufficient uh, safeguards in. So, I mean, that actually leads on to the, the open source versus closed source that you've got on the risks, is that when things are closed source, you have no idea really what people are doing. So when you look at um, encryption, for instance, uh, we know 
for a fact that the internet is in, say, the United States, and I would assume here in the UK, not secure, that the groups like the NSA have built very large data hoovering systems and were pretty much allowed to get away with it. Now, once you start moving that into the human body, do we think that these same people, the intelligence agencies, uh, companies that want to get rich, hackers, do we think they're going to go, mm, no, the human body is too far, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that alone? I think the human capacity to do naughty stuff is going to continue. So I think a lot of these technologies are going to need to have uh, built in from the ground up protection. And I suppose turning that over to the the kind of the biological, we're talking about moving into the body, like on the biological side of things. Are there any risks or pitfalls you can foresee, Leah? There's always potential risk, I suppose, when you're kind of messing around with genes. But I think that tends to be overplayed um, by the media. Okay, so I suppose what we're moving to next is the arguments for and against. Um, and the first thing we have listed here is the Malthusian trap. Uh, is everyone familiar with the Malthusian trap? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, actually. I was looking at it going, what's that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so Thomas Malthus was a, a, I think it was Thomas Malthus, he basically wrote about um, the dangers of population growth. So um, if people don't die quick enough, we are going to outstrip our capacity to feed and shelter, you know, feed and clothe and basically look after everybody. Which is generally the anti-immigration argument in a lot of places where it's sort of like the stupid localist argument of, oh, we don't have enough resources here for more people. It's like, well, there are still more people in the world and there's still more resources in the world. Why are we focused on such a small segment? But yeah, you, you can extrapolate that to a, to a planet-wide scenario, can't you? And to be fair, there's a certain sense of this. You know, we have only one planet to live on at the moment. We are currently burning through resources faster than we can replenish them. So at some point, we will run out of those resources. So there is a there must be a theoretical theoretical maximum number of people that Earth can hold. Um, but we don't know what that number is. And one of the arguments about things like life extension um, is if nobody's dying, the population growth is going to go through the roof which is what I meant earlier about saying that our society won't survive everyone living to the age of 300. You know, society will have to change if we're going to have uh, I mean, significant housing, life extension. Food, uh, resources, entertainment, transport. I mean, if you think about the amount of fossil fuels that are used to provide for everyone now, what happens when you, you increase the population exponentially because people just don't die, but people still continue to give birth? Yeah, yeah, that's the big one. Um, people giving birth is the big one, you know? We need to, the the birth rate is already low in the Western world. It's below replenishment levels, but it needs to get lower. I mean, we're already at seven billion people. We're already um, it looks like um, more people than Earth can really handle in our our current setup. So if people kept on living, yeah, we'd have real problems. And that's the Malthusian argument. So the Malthusian argument is that um, it's already possible to outstrip resources by population. Um, and the Malthusian argument is made exponentially more valid when you start expanding lifespans without decreasing population growth. Yeah, because, it, I mean, an interesting thing there is we, we, we are starting to reduce. I mean, again, this is, this is different across the world, but in general, as countries get richer, the birth rate drops. So uh, I think it was in the 80s, it was famous that the UK had 2.4 children for every household and there was a sitcom named 2.4 children because of this and now i think we've dropped down to nearly two and and you get to a point where uh, japan i think has gone a bit further where, where they're kind of you know they have an aging population so there's a problem from that but they don't really have the birth rate to catch up with it and and that means the birth rate is slowing but if we then suddenly make everyone live a lot longer we haven't fixed that issue of overpopulation and you'd have to think significantly about you know am i going to bring children into the world in a world where there won't be resources for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the next set of arguments, and Leah, I'll let you feel this one first, is religious arguments for or against. What are they and how would we feel about them? I think a lot of religious people would kind of, yeah, say it's kind of messing with how we've been created or how God intended, um, which obviously I don't agree with. I don't agree, believe that there's any sort of intent. There's no sort of how we should be, if that makes sense, because Obviously, I don't believe that we were created in anyone's image, so... Yeah, there's only how we are. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, is it very far removed from what's already been happening for the last billions of years, which is that we've evolved and changed to adapt to our environment? Right now, we're adapting to an environment that we've created, and probably part of that is um, is is altering ourselves as well. And I mean, like, the argument starts to fall down when it's arbitrary lines. It's kind of like the 
the veganism argument of at what point is an animal a pet and not livestock. Mm. Um, in that, oh, you can't do that. You're messing with the natural order of things. Well, you know what else is messing with the natural order of things? Driving a car. Exactly. That's not natural. We, we, we artificially constructed a better means of doing something. And you're okay yeah. with that. But you're not okay with another form of artificially constructing a better means of doing something. Like, the arguments fall down when they're examined so very quickly um, from an atheist perspective, or even perhaps an agnostic perspective, or some religious people's perspective. Um, but people still latch onto it as a, a very serious and unbreachable argument. Like, it is a stone wall with some people, communities, and places. But, I mean... When we think about that and, and the effect on society, we spoke about correlation between um, more developed or wealthy societies having lower birth rates. There is also, I believe, a clear correlation between standards of living increasing and possibly as a consequence, religious participation decreasing. That's in one of Sam Harris's books, isn't it, that he mentions that, Leah? Yeah, 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 that makes sense, of course, because like... Yeah, I think one of the reasons that the idea of God even sort of evolved, um, whether it evolved culture or biologically or both, was as as a what, means of comforting people, as a means of, of gaining meaning, uh, especially when things go really horribly wrong in times of famine and things like that. And obviously, as those things become less and less of a problem, there is less of a reliance on that, um, on, on a kind of higher purpose. There's less a need for it. <clears throat> and also a lot of the... Um... I know I used to be a Christian, and and the thing that converted deconverted me was when you actually read the the the, the holy books. Is there so much nonsense in there that mm. to be an active believer requires that you ignore whole swaths of your own holy book? So if you look at you know, I mean, a, a lot of modern Christians will say, well, that's allegory; it's not meant to be taken literally. And you think, well, it's only allegory since we proved it wrong. Before we proved it wrong, it was it was considered, you know, doctrine. So you go back a thousand years, people believed the account of Genesis literally. No one was talking about, the, you know, the early chapters of the Bible and saying, well, take in mind, this is all allegorical. They were like, no, we are descended from Adam and Eve. That was the doctrinal position of the faith. The only reason that it's not the doctrinal position of the faith now is because we know that it's wrong and we've proved that it's wrong. Um so they've had to change away. And if you can do that with one part of the holy book, why not other parts? Which means that you have to critically evaluate everything in the book on its own merits. And of course, as soon as you do that, you realise you don't need the book at all. And I think there's also, uh, again, mentioning the book Sapiens, which is a uh, kind of a good history of the human race. Um, it, it discusses uh, things like the, the fact that hum humans have to believe in myths, like the, the at the moment, you know, it, most humans can keep track of, I think, something like 120 people. It's like chimpanzees, it's about 35. That's like the maximum size they can get to in, in like a, a group before they fall apart. And with hum humans, it's about 120. But the thing we have is we can believe in, in a myth, a cultural myth. Uh, and, and that allows us. So, so it's like you can have patriotism where you believe in I am part of this country and everyone in this country is, is good and I follow them. And, and religion is obviously a big famous one. And as we've gone through... As we've gone, you know, through history, kind of what our myths are and things we believe in are changing, and 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 the world has become more global. And, and arguably, things like like money, money is essentially this myth. We all believe that money works, and so it does. Like, there's no yeah, longer any money, gold. Money is just just a, a concept. It doesn't like. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, even gold. It's a measuring has no stick for stuff. Yeah, G gold has no intrinsic value, really. Like, it's just we say gold. Uh, gold was hard to get, so we said, and it was shiny, so we said it was worthwhile. Um. It has some particular uses in like electronics, but you know, in in general, it has no. People wanted value. it, therefore it had value. Yeah, and so you have have these things like concepts like now now people believe in companies, for example, like a, like a limited liability company is an example in the book of a of a brilliant human invention because now the company outlives the people. So if if someone had a great idea and had a great shop and then died, well, that shop would normally like the shop would still physically exist, but like the, the stuff would get lost. Whereas a company kind of maintains that information and it's anyway it's a very interesting book i'm not going to spoil the rest of it but um it's kind of a, similarly with like religion we have this moving myth and i think i'm not sure it, it does that not necessarily kind of fitting in fits a bit into transhumanism as a kind of a progress thing where like i i, I feel for, for the survival of the human the most important thing in the long term for us is to like unite as, as a world uh, obviously, that's a long way off. You know, we have problems like we're struggling to keep Europe together at the moment <laughs> with us leaving it. Um, but uh, it's 
the idea that there is something bigger than ourselves and and and, and like the most important thing f- for humans is to like have an off off world backup and then an off solar system backup because anything could happen to the planet and it would screw us all over um and so i i think uh so i think i think again as we're moving through history we're, we're changing the myths we believe in and that's kind of taking away the kind of hopefully we'll slowly take away the religious argument there so do we do we we all agree that perhaps it's likely that as um these procedures these technologies become increasingly available um they will potentially cause a shift away from religion as people are less reliant on it and i mean one of the i believe one of the major sort of factors in religion is fear particularly of death there's a lot of religions try to explain what happens after we die if we eliminated death as a concept if we achieved immortality it would cause all of those problems we mentioned earlier all of the malthusian arguments all the resource arguments all the overpopulation arguments but if we eliminated death or made it so far away that it was it was it didn't bear thinking about i think it would change religion um okay yeah i think that's more likely yeah, there because there are other aspects of religion that I think will continue to be important to people. There's, you know, it's morality and philosophy behind it, and and not all of it's necessarily about, you know, believing in a supernatural kind of father that's looking after you. So, yeah, I think it will become less literal and less about death. But I don't think it will necessarily eliminate religion or or even make people considerably less religious. I think somewhat. Less religious. Yeah, I mean, I think I think kind of that's uh, I maybe didn't put it so well, but that's kind of what I'm saying, like with the the myth stuff, like yeah. We believe, but, but at least you know, until we change ourselves so drastically that it's no longer a thing, we we have to kind of believe in something yeah. as a species, and and that what that is will change. But it, it's interesting that uh, I sometimes find it interesting, like America, we we get the impression is more religiously charged than the UK, but they are they're like the most first world country, you know, that they have all the the things that they're arguably yeah. the most ahead in all these ways arguably uh, and it's interesting that there there's more kind of religious influence than we have I, mean, I feel like in general the uk is very um secular and, and so yeah it's, it's the overall trend i think may be going a certain way but there's kinks along the road and and things are always going to be a little different in different places yeah exactly there are loads of factors i think part of that as well is that we've got an, uh, an official church which makes a big a big amount of difference particularly in the english psyche because we don't really trust our government in any real sense. Um, so when you have an official church, well, that's great because now you know that it's wrong because it's government sponsored. Um, whereas the Americans have got a, a, a much more freewheeling system where their religions all basically compete for each other with each other to see who's kind of the, the most, um, who can get the most followers, which leads to this kind of bizarre system where it's almost like instead of being based around the religion, They've had to adapt themselves to be the most uh, saleable. You know, they're not really, they can't survive by being about the religion. They have to be about getting the punters in, about pleasing their their base, because otherwise they, those people will simply go elsewhere. Whereas in the UK, for a very long period of time, you couldn't go elsewhere because, you know, if you wanted to be a Catholic instead, well, no, we're actually just going to burn you instead. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a choice that you could freely ship around. So the next set of arguments... We touched upon it briefly. Slippery slope arguments. We start here. Where do we start? When will this madness end? (laughs) When no human can breed with any other human and we're all individual species and die out like idiots. I mean, where can it go, really? Like, how how far can it go? How far should it go? What are your personal views as a pair of individuals and scientists on where you think limits should be drawn? Um, I'm perfectly happy for to modify people for medical reasons. Um, I have difficulty going beyond that. Um, so you don't necessarily believe in designer baby. Yeah, I mean, I think it's difficult. I'm not necessarily 100% we should only use it for medicine. But I just, I, I struggle, yeah, I struggle with with selecting traits that are beneficial or that are perceived to be beneficial because it's partly because it's so subjective in a lot of ways. Um, we touched on sort of inequality earlier. I think that's quite an important aspect of it potentially. Um, although obviously of course with media portrayals of it it really plays it up and and that's unhelpful but I think that's a real concern but I think in terms of eliminating disease um, and possibly just kind of aiding kind of what would be our our natural selection uh, our evolutionary process anyway I think is is fine and desirable. Yeah I go with that Um, I mean I I, the slippery slope argument has always seemed to me to be a bit of a, a, a false start because this isn't 
really the kind of thing that we're going that is that it isn't a slippery slope it's a it's a series of individual decisions that will have to be taken on their own merits yeah exactly. it's not like we're going to say one day we found a, <clears throat> a way to cure cystic fibrosis but i'm really worried about people becoming superhuman you know it's, <laughs> it's going to be we found a way to cure cystic fibrosis good we should yeah. you know we should look at whether we can use this safely we can cool okay let's use that and then someone else will come along and say I found a way to make us all superhuman and it'll be right let's have an argument about that i don't see that one necessarily will lead to another um particularly the way that things are adopted plus you you often hear the slippery slope argument is often deployed um in avenues where it really shouldn't be so you know when you're talking about when gay marriage was being discussed there were people saying well what's to stop a man marrying or a dog yeah and you think you know really you know that's (laughs) that to me is the essence of kind of like, Here's it's just the thing I don't like. Why you bring it up? Yeah, and it's like, we'll tell you what. If you're advocating marrying your son or marrying a dog, have that discussion, and I'll I'll argue against it. But I don't <laughs> think this thing is going to lead to that thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. And the last one is the inequality argument. Is but I think we've already addressed that with the discussion regarding the fact that at least one of us believes it will be rolled out to everybody, and that it will not be withheld from another group of people. Um, I suppose you know. After after a couple hundred years, um, every race got some sort of rights. It might not be equal yet, but you know, maybe things do happen eventually. But maybe maybe not quick enough. Maybe maybe the inequality will persist for a couple hundred years. In the short term, we probably won't get rid of inequality, right? But the, I think the, the the kernel of Ollie's argument earlier was that as 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 a technology becomes cheaper and easier to produce, it just essentially becomes. Um, a utility for everyone at yeah. some point. I mean, you still have to buy the thing, but it becomes so easy to buy that you can walk. You know, in, you can go and buy a, a telephone for five pounds. But would like, it be acceptable, for example, to go through 150 years of inequality until it became at that point? I mean, we can't predict how long it's going to be. Is it acceptable to permit that severe levels of increased inequality due to a new technology for a limited amount of time when we don't know how long that time may be? I don't think it's it's. I don't think it's moral to have the level of inequality we have now. I think it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. But I think that's unrelated to the technological issue. I think there's already vast inequality. But I think technology is one of the equalizers. So, you know, I mean, like I said about mobile phones, if you are unemployed now and have never had a job, you probably still own a mobile phone, which 20 years ago or 30 years ago was a luxury item for the very rich. And now, you know, there's more mobile phones than there are people. Um, you know, the internet was once, you know, defense and academia only. And now pretty much everyone is, you know, web connected in some form or another. Um, I think a lot of these technologies, the thing that will hold them back won't be the inequality. Um, because I think that will pass quickly enough as companies basically try and ship this out to as many people as possible. Also, the whole thing about 150 years of inequality, I don't think we can honestly say what the world will look like 100 years from now, let alone 50 years. Things are changing so quickly, and people don't really appreciate how quickly they're changing. Uh, I don't think we can imagine the world 150 years from now. I don't think it will look like anything we'd recognise. I mean, if you think how much the world has changed in the last 50 years, uh, and it's getting faster, that rate of change. You know, as long as we've had society with like kings and stuff, there's always been one person who who ha- had a load of money, and then maybe some nobles below him. And but in- inequality has reduced overall. We may be having a blip now where inequality um, is worse than it has been um, in the last 100 years. But overall, as far as society goes, inequality has been getting better as technology and education spreads to more people. Then you lose this ability to like have your sway, sway over people because you're all the intellectuals and stuff. You know, as everyone gets more intelligent uh, in general, because they have better, we have better education, better access to information via the internet, um, it levels the playing field. Not to mention that even when things get more unequal, the the base that you are starting with, the, the most, like the poorest people in society now are infinitely richer than the poorest people in society 50 years ago. You know, I mean, like I was saying about, you know, mobile phones for, for even for people who've never, you know, never been employed. I mean, the the access to technology and the access to, to um, standards of living that are, is enjoyed by the very poorest people in this country are still well better than anything we had 50, 60 years ago. And I don't see that getting worse. Um, I mean, there are some worrying trends like the growth in food banks 
Um, so is this a sort of rising tide that's all boats are? Yes, I think that gets vastly overestimated, but I think there is a kernel of truth in it. Like, you know, I think it's true that a, a rising tide technology, that, that technology does become available to more people and it does make people's lives better. Uh, I think you can definitely over-egg that put in. Um, and there are some worrying trends out there at the moment on on inequality. Like we are we are so unequal as a society at the moment, but most people are aren't really having a problem with that because because most people are doing okay compared to you know their 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 parents essentially. You know, I mean, the lifestyle that people have. So, I mean, you, you don't have to be on very much money to have a decent life. Obviously, a lot harder when you have kids and stuff. But yeah, I do think there is a bit of a rising tide. We discussed this recently, didn't we, Leo, in terms of economics um, and that certain economic theories, whilst creating larger poverty gaps, still yeah. improve the minimum standard. Uh, the minimum standard can increase even if the gap between the minimum and the maximum increases. Yeah, and I think that's a really important thing to remember. While inequality isn't necessarily great um, and there are things we should do to alleviate it if there are people living in, in unlivable circumstances, Inequality in itself doesn't necessarily mean that there are loads of poor people or that people are poor. Like, it simply means that some people are not as rich as others. Yeah, exactly. So really the last bit is quite simple, and that's the pitfalls of technological or sociological prediction. And that is that we're really just guessing based on what we have. Um, it's estimations and predictions, and any of it could be proven wrong at any time by the next miraculous breakthrough, couldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Te technology is one of the hardest things to predict because it changes so quickly. Um, I, I, one of my favourite quotes is uh, Bill Gates in some time in the, I think, the 1980s saying, I, I, saying, no one ever needs more than 512k of RAM. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there's other things like people say, um, I think it was IBM that said, I see, I see a market in the world for about 12 computers. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, things change and people get things very wrong. I've got a great book by Ray Kurzweil, who I mentioned earlier, and he makes a series of predictions through it um, about where technology will be, uh, I think it's like five years, 10 years, 25 years. But this book came out in the 90s, which is when I picked it up, and I, I reread it a while ago. And it's remarkable how much he got correct by basically extrapolating from current trends, but how much as well he missed. Like, he thought we would wear dozens of computers each essentially monotasked and we would wear them as kind of like you know jewelry as like little devices so you'd have a tiny pager that you might wear as a ring and you'd have like a tiny mapping device that you might slip into a pocket but he completely missed that we would all be carrying around smartphones you know that we would carry a single device that does almost everything and you think you know this is a guy who's really got his pulse on the the kind of technological change he's not looking that far into the future at all uh, and he completely didn't get that. He completely missed it. So, yeah, I think we are going to be completely blindsided by the next big technological leap. I mean, like we were with the Internet. I think that there are things that we can predict because we understand the theory and because we already, in some cases, have the beginnings of that technology. And we can sort of extrapolate and say, well, you know, in 100 years, this will happen, this will happen. And then there are other things which are just changes in in kind, basically, rather than in like the spectrum kind of changes so things that yeah things that we can't predict that are just totally different from what we have so i think there's kind of an element of both yeah yeah absolutely i mean some of these technologies uh, are so like society changed like you know the internet was was the big one you know for yeah. me it's like if the internet hadn't been if, if we hadn't had the internet we would have a, a very different society today but the eventually of the internet is driving so many changes so many trends um like, you know, the resurgence of really quite abhorrent views, I think, is largely internet driven because people who are bigots can now find support for their their perspective. You know, if, if you are a horrible, misogynistic racist, you are probably the only one that you know locally. And you can't talk about your views because everyone would tell you to shut up. However, you can go on a website and you can find hundreds of people like you all over the planet, all over the country, who feel exactly the same. And you can feel then that your views are somehow justified. You know, you're not the only one who feels this. You're not the weirdo. Everyone else is. I think that has, that has been a driving force behind uh, the kind of the resurgence of um, kind of very right wing and very misogynistic and racist views. Um, I think it's also been behind largely the, the kind of the changes we've seen in high street stores and city centres. You know, we're, we're seeing a lot of businesses finding it very difficult to maintain 
uh, physical properties because they can't compete with internet shopping. Because actually, a lot of people don't want to go, you know, dragging themselves around town. They'd rather just buy the things they need with a couple of clicks online. So, you know, shops have had to change. Businesses have had to change. It's been a huge driving force. You, you see a lot of stuff where people, people, people kind of sometimes seem like they're innovating for innovation's sake. Um, it, I think that's the problem. Like we're having a massive boom of technology right now. We have all this stuff, this kind of AI stuff coming in, these, um, uh, you know, um, machine learning and all that kind of stuff is kind of being applied in a lot of ways. And sometimes people aren't necessarily thinking through the ramifications of what they do, um, which I suppose kind of ties into the arguments we've been making tonight. So, I mean, for example, um, Google Duplex got announced um, at I.O., which is last week. And that's a, a service where you can say, hey, Google. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say that on, on a podcast in case people are listening. So, <laughs> yeah. hey, Guillermo, which is the one used by the material podcast. Um, so, yeah, you could say, hey, Guillermo, um, uh, phone uh, make a reservation for me at this restaurant tonight and and it phones up and it in, impersonates a human voice including like ums and ahs and mm, let me just check and and pretends to be your per, like your personal assistant your pa ringing and books and i mean obviously they showed a specific example we don't know how well it would work you know if, if it did, does it get stuck in a loop if someone keeps asking it like questions it's not expecting and stuff that was very impressive though oh That's... yeah it's really impressive it's kind of whoa like i didn't expect it to sound that good yeah. But then the the following discussion after that has been like, well, you know, were they thinking this through? Because like <laughs> one of the arguments I've heard is that it's making making people in people at the, the restaurants like the end of an, the API endpoint for Google, <laughs> which is kind of an interesting way of describing it. Uh, uh, but then it has loads of benefits of people who are um, uh, disabled, for example, or might have certain anxieties where they struggle struggle to to speak to pe- to strangers. But then, then the flip side argument is, at least for the anxiety people with anxiety, is maybe it's better for them to actually be forced into doing these calls, but but by circumstance because it it can help them improve their situation. And, and I think there's a lot of this. There is a lot of ethical discussion going on right now, and I think it's really good because I think people have cottoned on, especially with things like we said, Cambridge Analytica, etc. The average person is now thinking about this more than they did. And I think there's a lot of good discussion going on about what are these ethical ramifications. How is this going to affect society? And hopefully, people now that people are more switched on to it, we might start making more sensible decisions, especially at like government level, where often the, the people at the government level don't know so much about the technology. So I hope that now it's more aware. I hope I hope we'll have less knee-jerk reactions um, that, than we have been having. That's the hope, anyway. Mm. I mean, the uh, did you watch the Senate hearings with Facebook? <laughs> yes, yes. It was just, it was just painful the the level of ignorance that these people who make the laws were were showing about the technology that they were supposed to be regulating. It was it was quite scary. Oh yeah, it's like the Facebook stuff as well. Like it's when you when you're saying that you know they they did something and didn't expect it to be used for other things, etc. That's exactly what Facebook said in a lot of their arguments is that when we created Facebook, we didn't expect to have to be thinking about this. We didn't expect to have this kind of social responsibility to have to regulate things, have to worry about people's data protection to this extent, um, to, to worry about how we're going to find it. And then you have the senators sat there just not understanding the technology in the slide and trying to make laws and rule on it without remotely having a clue what they were talking about. I think public understanding of science is a really important one, but I'm sort of not sure how to go about kind of improving it and, and sort of you know kind of explaining the technologies to people and explaining and and sort of stopping it from kind of being this kind of dystopian scary thing that that you get from a lot of the media i think it's a difficult question yeah absolutely as well just you know if people aren't understanding this technology how can they make informed decisions as to how it should be used yeah exactly um i mean people say we need to have a public debate about this but you think well actually though what's the value in having a public debate if the public are, are very misinformed about the actual facts. Exactly. Like for some people are still kind of arguing about GMO. And, oh, you know, goodness. while there's some debate to be had, I mean, basically GMOs are safe, right? And it's a really, really useful technology and it has been used. It's tricky, isn't it? It's like, what can we do about this, this kind of lack of information? How can we inform people so that they, you know, they can meaningfully contribute to the conversation that's being held? See, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of people that don't want to be informed. There's a lot of people that want to ask, they want to question things, but they don't want to hear the answers. And that's where you get people like conspiracy theorists. I like to believe that generally people are open to information and are open to understanding things. But when you, when, you know, you have the internet, you have so much, yeah, I guess. Well, I suppose when you have the internet, if you're not an expert, it can be very, conf- maybe can be quite confusing to distinguish kind of sensible things and 
proper information and facts from just, you know, nonsense. Well, have you heard Eddie Bravo talk about conspiracy theories? It's terrifying how people just straight up give him the answers to what he's asking. They're like, yeah, but how do you know, bro? How do you mm. know? Like, you've just been told. You don't know. Yeah. And he's just surrounded by people who are, like, slapping themselves in the head going, oh, my God, you're wasting our time. Um, and, like, he's coming up with some argument on um, the Joe Rogan experience about how do you know nuclear bombs are real? <laughs> like, I think they're a myth that we've all been lied to about them. And it's just that we've got this idea, but they never got them to work, but they, they made us think they did, so we're scared of it. Um, and it, and it's almost like, well, you can see footage of nuclear bombs. He's it. like, yeah, but I don't know that's a nuclear bomb. That could just be a normal bomb, but bigger. <laughs> That could just be a big bomb. How do I know it's nuclear? I think as well, though, it, the internet allows stupid people access to conversations that they would have been excluded from on the basis <laughs> of Because, you know, these people have always existed. You know, there, there's always been people who've been woefully misinformed um, and, and lazy in their research. You know, they are not a new phenomena. But before, they would have been laughed out the room. But now they can find a place where they can talk to others about their theories. And because it makes for good news, they get repeated. So, I mean, you look at the uh, the flat earthers mm. and you think, you know, God, you, there's no proof that these people would exist, that, that, that these people would accept. Um, I'm pretty sure that fully half of them are actually just trolling the other half. Yeah. <laughs> but there's yeah. got to be there are some real people out there that actually believe this stuff who are really just that dumb. Um, but you think, how can you know, how can you do with these people? What can you do about their chronic kind of lack of information there's there's nothing the only thing you can really do is ignore them um and not invite them to the party and stop giving them the oxygen that they so desperately want i think sometimes when people gain access to a small amount of information they think that they've become experts um i think the phrase is is something like a small a, a little bit of information is a dangerous thing because it's kind of more dangerous than knowing nothing because people who know nothing quite often know that they know nothing yeah. But then if somebody kind of picks up a book and, and then is like, oh, I know about this now. On the same line of thought, there's also a, a saying that a person who knows a lot is aware of how much they don't know. Um, yeah. Scientists very often speak of things as, as theoreticals, as maybes, as possiblies, whereas people who are less informed speak of them as absolutes. Yeah. So yeah. people who are less informed often speak with more confidence. Absolutely. Um, and as a result are more heard. Absolutely. So... I think we're we're starting to stray from transhumanism now. We're starting to go into, <laughs> yeah. into wider subjects. We've been talking for a long time. Um, so thank you both for joining us for this episode. I do hope that you enjoyed it. Um, I certainly enjoyed asking the questions and hearing some of the answers. Um, thank you. Do you have anything you wished? Do you have anything you wish to plug while you're here? Do you have any any um, articles, any uh, bits of social media, or any any bits of research, any papers that that perhaps people might want to check out? No, I don't think there's any one kind of killer book or anything to read i think if you want a good perspective on transhumanism you could do worse than picking up a ray kurzweil book um his books even if you don't i mean i i, I don't agree with kurzweil on a lot of stuff but i think he lays out very clearly his position which is followed by a lot of transhumanists so i think they're worth a read for that alone i don't know him but i've picked up a book by gregory stock called redesigning humans so hopefully that'll be interesting uh, i mean other classic ones for the transhumanist eric drexler engines of creation that's pretty much the foundational tome for nanotechnology. Uh, Kevin Warwick's books, he's got a couple out. I think he's got one called I Cyborg, which is um, about his um, his implants. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's worth reading. Um, like I say, even if you reject a lot of what's in it, it's very useful for a kind of primer on the, the whole situation. Lee, have you got any papers or anything? Um, anything that works that people might want to check out? Just um, I'm sure there must be some great some great articles on CRISPR, but can't sort of quite find them just now. I mean, if you send them through to me, I'll add them to the show notes. Yeah, cool, I'll do that. Okay. So, uh, Tom, our next topic, we're going to pull that one out of the hat. We have got musicals. 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 Excellent. So join us next time on How Many Things, where we will be discussing musicals, of which Tom has participated in some, I believe. Uh, yes, that is true. And, Excellent. Um, so next time you can find out which songs Tom has sung on stage <laughs> and how well or badly he did. <laughs> Do you have any recordings? I mean, I have got one, and it's on the end of one of our podcast episodes. I think on so, the end of the, uh, the music episode, I did um, Hellfire that I recorded for the podcast. So. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's going to get reposted because we only have one clip. Wonderful. 
Um, do you two have any favourite musicals, Oliver, uh, Leah? Ooh. <laughs> I liked Chicago when it came out. I like Chicago. Chicago's, Chicago's where it ran into the knife 27 times, right? Yeah. <laughs> Cabaret. I was quite a fan of um, Phantom of the Opera. It's quite a... Even if Andrew Lloyd Webber is a horrible person. <laughs> yes. Reportedly. Yes. Even then. Excellent. Well, that is that for transhumanism, a very broad subject that we managed to talk about for a very long time. I did suspect it would be a long episode. Uh, it really is a rabbit hole. There's an awful lot of reading. There's an awful lot of stuff to do. There are a lot of people who are creeped out by the concepts because it, it can be very uncanny valley. But it really is an interesting rabbit hole to dive into. There, there It goes very deep and there are a lot of different branches. Uh, I really highly recommend doing some reading. And if you do want to uh, engage in any discussion, please do uh, message any of us and we will attempt to respond. So thank you for joining us on the Hat of Many Things. You can join us at, uh, you can join the discussion on our Reddit, which is uh, r slash Hat of Many Things. There's also links to our Twitter and Facebook in the um, in the show notes. And of course, you can come to the website, hatofmanythings.com and comment directly on the episode. And if you want to support us, go to patreon.com forward slash TTSS. I enjoy this kind of discussion because I'm very often used to being the smartest person in the given room and I'm very much not in this conversation. And that is that is perfect. I, I love that. It's best to be surrounding yourself with people whom you can learn from. Well, no argument from us. <laughs> <laughs>